One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten.
Okay, well, starting now the final session of this successful Cosmo meeting, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Ofer Lahar from UCL, who's going to talk on dark energy observational probes. Thanks very much, Anne. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks, organizers, for, for the invitation and for a great uh, meeting. Apologies my, for missing a couple of days due to UCL commitments, uh, including missing the banquet. Uh, so, months ago I gave the title Observational Probes and Alternative Models, then I realized in the program several distinguished theoreticians are speaking after me about alternative models, so I leave most of it to them, and I thought I'll focus more on the uh, observational probes, especially one of the surveys I'm going to talk about is the Dark Energy Survey, and uh, uh, the telescope is shown um, on the right there. Uh, where actually we started the survey this week. Some of you might have seen the press release. So this is quite a special week for us. Um, just to summarize, we heard a lot about the status of cosmology at, at present, uh, mainly driven by Planck. Uh, I'd like to talk on something which it perhaps does not get enough attention, which I find quite interesting, to look at, do we see dark energy on megaparsec scales? Touch on that. then. Rather than describing in five seconds each of the projects around the world, I thought I'll focus on two projects which are kind of fairly generic in their nature and can indicate to you, especially perhaps to the theoretical part of the, the audience, uh, the way it's actually done. And the one is the Dark Energy Survey. Uh, the second is, uh, which is an imaging survey, the second is uh, uh, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, which is a union of Big Boss and DESPEC, so we've got now Des and Desi. My four-year-old daughter asked me if Des a man and Desi a woman. You know, it's um, <laughs> a bit confusing. I think I'll I'll say Des when I mean Des and Desi when I mean Desi. Uh, combined probes, and and maybe a bit speculating about the future. So we heard a lot about this, the un the known unknown, 95 percent of the universe. I think the. Uh, George uh, and, and Joanna gave a excellent talks about the, the, the you know, improvement um, due to Planck, although no big picture hasn't changed. Uh, the way we do it as, as, as um, observers, we obviously have probes, and they're listed here, uh, many of them already being discussed. And, and really, mathematically, what it is is that um, each probe has its own physics, and uh, this is a probe of clustering, which is most, what most those probes are, uh, has its own physics and setup, observation setup. So in galaxy survey, it would be the number of galaxies with redshift. And the power spectrum comes here. So basically, we are interested in the power spectrum, and this is, these are the window functions. So that's what we do. And that's when you have two different probes. Uh, you, you can do a cross-correlation. If you have just this one probe, it's an autocorrelation. Um, and basically what this manifests are two physical effects, the geometry and the growth of structure. I'll mention in passing, this will come later, that I think uh, the future seems to go now in the direction of cross correlations. So a cynical view is, you know, if you have probe A and you got bored with it, and you have probe B and you got bored with it, what do you do next? You do A cross B. But I actually think there's more to it, and there's a lot of power in it. We've seen it, some illustrations in the CMB talks that they so what is dark energy? Certainly in DMTP, no need to write again this equation, but it's good to remind ourselves that uh, assuming it's something like lambda, there's still a freedom of putting it on the left-hand side, and you can call it modified gravity relative to what it was before uh, Einstein put it there, or you can put it on the right-hand side and absorb it to the team you knew. And I think this is the generic problem of is it something a modification to the underlying curvature, or is it actual stuff? You know, in every uh, cup of tea, there is a bit of dark energy, right? That, that's kind of, I think, the, the question. Now, there's a long list of options there. I already discussed this week. Um, is it just systematics? Is it lambda CDM, dynamical scalar field, signatures for modified gravity in homogeneous universe, anthropic principle? I'm not sure I'm allowed to talk about it here, but maybe. Uh, something else uh, unpredictable. Uh, George, as I walked in, George said, but we know W is minus one, so let's take a vote. I said, how do you know? 
in a longer talk, I'll probably go one by one, but then the chairperson would not be too happy. So how many would vote it's just Lambda? Everyone. George, look around. It's not everyone. <laughs> it's not everyone. <laughs> what did, what did, what I, what I miss? Right, okay. okay. How many think people think it's something completely different, which we haven't even thought about? Okay, that's silence there. All right. <laughs> I, I, uh, I should also mention, it's quite interesting, the reflections of the community to the uh, Planck result. I believe the, correct me, George, I believe the, the ESO, the ESA, ESA press release said an almost perfect universe, which I still have a hard time understanding what it actually means. The New York Times, I think, was a bit more, I think, more perceptive in my view, a simple but strange universe. So here we are. In terms of results, lots has happened in terms of galaxy surveys. Uh, the Sloan, obviously, uh, produced lots of good data, and BOSS is a kind of uh, follow-up of this. It's spectroscopic, so here you can see the correlation function against separation uh, with uh, a remarkable peak. This is the baronic acoustic oscillation. Uh, then translated into W, constant W on omega m, uh, and adding CMB at the time, it's pre-Planck, uh, you can see that it zooms in quite nicely on the minus 1.3 plus minus 07, so kind of in accord with later what Planck plus plus found. One important remark here, too, that's the point people say, look, we're, we're, we're moving to work on exoplanets. I mean, this is cosmology solved. Uh, but remember, this is for an assumed constant W. It's an assumed constant W. The moment you relax that, if you read carefully the tables in those papers, you see error bars on the time derivative of W to be of the order of 20%. Uh, this is not a very nice illustration from Chris Blake. Uh, the Australians have done this project called Wiggle Z. And uh, what's nice here is it's basically Hubble diagram. So it's quite intuitive. Redshift here and distance, except that now we know distance is through BAO. So the, these are the supernovae scattered all over. Um, Boss, sorry, Sloan, these are black lines, uh, and, and the uh, Wiggle Z. What's, I'd like to draw your attention to kind of a new technique, or a technique which is, I think has matured now, to actually use the Lyman Alpha cloud. So these are clouds between us and the quasars. And because we have many, many lines, we can actually use it to, to do uh, BAO. So that's kind of a new technique. So Redshift 2, we, are, we actually have that. Um, Result, of course, acceleration happens below Redshift 1, but it's good to see that continuity. So I think that's quite nice. Um, a new, well, I, I can't say a new technique because uh, I remember late 80s when I was a PhD student, I was Nick Kaiser, so work it out. So it's not all new at all. This is the redshift distortion. So what happens is redshift is not distance. There are peculiar velocities, especially around clusters. You can see an infall that's onion pattern here, there's also finger of God, and basically it means you see gravity in action. So this is the fluctuation galaxies, this is bias parameter. This is this growth factor, logarithmic derivative of fluctuations with respect to time, and this is the mass uh, fluctuations, and this is just the cosine of an angle. Uh, this is one parameterization of modified gravity. It goes back to Jim Peebles in the late 70s, uh, famous formula 0.6, and then there have been many, many iterations on that and um, for example, uh, you know, modified gravity models will give a different number. So one question, which hopefully might be discussed later, is this a good parameterization for modified gravity? In any case, this is this growth against redshift uh, proof of concept. You can really see gravity with time, with cosmic epoch. It's very exciting. And you can already rule out some funny models, say DGP, for example. Ah, the nice thing here, if you look at this equation, I should have put mu on that side as well. It's parabolic in mu. So in principle, you can solve for B and F independently, free of biasing, if you just do it as look at the angular pattern. But it's linear theory. This has to be said, it's linear theory. Now, again, leaving it to the wise speakers after me to, to map a pretty uh, a large zoo of uh, modified gravity, you know, what's a non-elephant? That's not easy to say. 
But this seems to be popular, okay? As a phenomenologist, I, I, I seem to get the impression this is quite generic, where you relax the idea uh, to have two potentials actually in the metric, not, not only one, not assuming they're equal. And then the different parameterizations in the literature, this one has Q and R, I'll show an example of that. R basically is the ratio of two potentials. So when it's exactly one, we're back to the standard GR, which gives the factor four in the deflection of light around the sun. Uh, and then there's this Q, which modifies uh, Poisson equation. But then, you know, we can keep many people happy. You can make Q and, and, uh, Q and R functions of redshift, and you can put it into MCNC, and be, get a big industry, and spend 10 years trying those different models. What's interesting here, because I, I said one theme of this talk is cross correlations. What's very interesting is that cosmic shear, and for that matter, anything which uh, describes the trajectory of photons depends on the sum of those two potentials, psi plus phi, while galaxy motions only depend on, the, uh, on psi. So you have nice complementarity here. You can, in principle, tell one from the other. Uh, and this has been an active area for research. Now, if I may, one minute to allow myself to be a bit philosophical about it. I, I find when I talk to funding agencies, in fact, we had a presentation yesterday to FTFC about a new project called DESI, you know, respecting members of the panel and so on. The moment you talk about you know, dark energy, modified gravity, it does sound science fiction to people who work on planets or on particle physics. But I think it's interesting, and likewise when you give public, uh, public outreach talks, I find it quite interesting to think about it, that really we're down to the point that when observations disagree with, an, with a model at a time, there are logically two possibilities. Well, first there's a the possibility that data are wrong, but let's assume that's okay. Two possibilities, either you add something, an entity, or you modify the theory. Now it's quite nice because in the solar system we've got those both examples. Right, Neptune, which was nearly discovered in Cambridge, uh, uh, predicted there based on unexplained motions of Uranus, right? So the wobble of Uranus indicated to clever mathematicians, Adam's here, that should be another planet there. And then it was discovered. That's a beautiful example, think of it as dark matter. Then, on the other hand, Mercury, of course, we know the explanation comes through GR. Um, in, incidentally, you may know that actually people suggested another planet, a Vulcan, to, to explain that, and this turned out to be wrong. So I think, I think we're in the same situation with dark energy. I'm actually collaborating, as a bit of entertainment, with a philosopher of science, Michela Massimi from Edinburgh, looking at some cases in, in, in physics and astronomy. So we mentioned those two. Beta decay, again, you either come up with a new particle or you violate the theory. So brackets is what didn't work, like Vulcan and violation of, of uh, conservation. Uh, galaxy flat rotation curves, we still don't know. Is it dark matter, which is what the majority of people think, or is it a tweak to gravity, uh, milgram beckenstein relations? And accelerating universe, we are there, right? We don't really know what it is. So I think it's quite interesting to think conceptually you have those, those two options, and it's our job to explain it. Now, I'd like to, I find, you know, it's kind of interesting. The observer seems to zoom in for a constant W on minus one. And yet, theoreticians are actually expanding the parameter space. You know, I only show the very modest parameterization. There's now other, other parameterizations uh, like the Hordensky, Lagrangian, things like that, which are a bit scary. You know, many, many parameters. So I'm just looking for something that I can actually understand. Okay, so this comes to the question, what happens to a bound system? So in a simulation, and body simulations, uh, what happens is you just put one over R squared, and the box itself is expanding. But when it's a bound system, uh, LTB, Lametter, Tolman, Bondi, that's an exact result. Uh, that actually you can see it as a, you can see it as a, as a sphere. Imagine a sphere collapsing. There's minus GM over R squared, uh, and uh, uh, then the addition of R. Uh, so it looks like Newtonian. Right, and it almost feels like Newtonian, and it's the right place in Cambridge to mention that Newton actually has got a linear force as well in his Principia, except he didn't put lambda over three, 
uh, John Barrow has written articles uh, together with a student, uh, Lucy Calder. We also wrote an article about this, just uh, elaborating. But in any case, this is the equation we're using. This is the current energy equation. So then you can take uh, the view that if you know certain parameters, you can, for example, tell the mass of the system or tell lambda. Uh, so it's in, the, the usual statement is, you know, what we tell students, look, it's cosmological constant, so we have to go to, to redshift one to do it. But can we do better? So on spherical collapse, you know, there have been studies along these lines, uh, even before the supernova studies. Uh, one discovery from me, this conference, talking to Anthony Layson, be that his group has written three papers, actually, uh, last year on, on uh, elaborating on this connect near to GR, uh, papers I still like to study. Uh, so uh, that's, the, that's the theory. Now, what happens in practice? How could you actually measure it? So there is a very old uh, argument called the timing argument, Kahn and Walter, 1959, which was then expanded by Lyndon Bell in the 81, but it doesn't take lambda into account. So I asked myself a naive question when a master's student looks for a project, Candice Partridge, uh, you know, what if we just take the classic timing argument? So the timing argument is that you have uh, Andromeda and Milky Way at the same place at the beginning, the universe expands, but they collapse, and if it's on a first collapse, uh, you know their uh, distance separation, you know their infra velocity, so you can play with that very simple equation there and actually get the mass. In fact, I think this argument is somewhat uh, not sufficiently credited for being one of the first to indicate the dark matter problem. So this was the question. After we kind of answered it, I then discovered that there's some papers by Chernin and even a problem in Bini and Tremaine um, on that. But what's remarkable, if you put the latest numbers, including Planck and those numbers, it makes a difference of 13% to the mass. So I would put it this way, the dark energy is visible on megaparsec scales. It makes 13% to the mass. Now people say, well, but that's a naive model. These are point masses, use simulations. So we've done that using simulations called clues. And it turns out, so red are, are, are those uh, in the old, sorry, blue are with the old um, model without putting lambda, red is with lambda. But bottom line, it brings it closer if you put the lambda in. But we can also use the simulations just to calibrate for other effects which we don't count in this simple model, such as tidal forces, uh, for example, and other neighbors. Yeah? Uh, bottom line, the number to take home, we find that our estimate for the virial mass of the local group is about 5, 10 to the 12 solar masses. So anyway, to me, it's kind of an in interesting indication of lambda on smaller scales. Moving to surveys, that's a very uh, big area now. Uh, you, broadly speaking, it's divided into photometric and spectroscopic surveys. Um, they're all listed there, including uh, space missions, Euclid, and uh, we heard about the new incarnation of W first the other day from David Spurgel. A lot is going on. As I said, there's no time. I showed some examples from surveys uh, such as Wiggle, Z, and Boss. Uh, just to say that, you know, these surveys basically aim at measuring W or deviations from modified gravity, but they'll produce billions of, of, of galaxies. And I think, um, you know, if we know the cosmology at some point, either from God or from a special technique, it's still plenty to do there. And it's not a bad deal. It's about $1 per galaxy. They call the, all the surveys, how much they cost, how many galaxies. It's $1 per galaxy. Uh, so this is a bit putting it on time scale. Again, it's, it's just, some examples, I don't pretend to show everything here, but multi-object spectrographs, 2DF was very uh, pioneering in a way, uh, and then BOSS, EBOSS, DESI, Euclid, and the imaging Sloan, Dark Energy Survey, LCT Euclid. So you can see there is this kind of mid-range projects, and then the big ones kick in at about 2020. Um, okay, the Dark Energy Survey, so, this is more than started 10 years ago. As I said, we actually started survey this week, on Saturday, in fact. Um, I was very fortunate when I left, after I left Cambridge, uh, 2DF came to an end, and straight after that, uh, together with Chicago, Fermilab, and other, many other institutions now, uh, we, we developed this uh, dark energy survey. It makes use of an existing telescope, 
it's quite remarkable that even use an, an existing telescope, it takes 10 years to build the instrument. No? That gives you time scale here. Um, uh, so it's a four meter Blanco telescope. The idea is to map 300 million galaxies over one eighth of the sky in connection with other surveys that look at the same direction, Vista Hemisphere Survey, uh, SPT classes. And the idea is to do, it's a, it's a multi-probe approach, which at the time, by the way, was quite, when we proposed it, was a bit unusual. Now it's very common if you look, for example, at Euclid. So you look uh, simultaneously from the 300 million galaxies, you create a catalog of clusters and you do weak lensing and large construction. Then with selected fields, you look at supernovae. Uh, and I did say, I think, the telescope is in Chile. Oh, so yeah, so first light we had last September, a year ago. And I'll show some examples from that. And the survey just started. Uh, uh, this week. Again, this is the you know, credits to all the institutions involved. There are six universities in the UK, as you can see, um, plus uh, 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 four other nations involved, uh, Brazil, Spain, Germany, and Switzerland. Uh, it's about 200 collaborations. Organization of projects probably need attention, not a talk. The director is, uh, founding director is John Peoples, current director, George Freeman, of course, there are instrumentation people, Brenna Flower. Uh, I chair the science committee, which has all these uh, different um, uh, groups with, with co-coordinators. Co co I just want to emphasize that we have, apart from the core science, we have uh, uh, working groups on, for example, Milky Way science and galaxy evolution. So we don't close our eyes to the possibility that there's other exciting science. This is the footprint. Ignore the red line. This was another possibility. But this would be the footprint, 5,000 square degrees. First year, as of this week, is, is half the area and about two-fifths of the depth. And we, we decided to put high emphasis on overlap with SPT because we're quite excited about cross-correlating galaxies and shear with SPT. We'll also do it with Planck, of course. But it's a fertile ground. Uh, Vista Hemisphere su Survey, uh, Bridget McMahon at Iowa is, is the PI of this, and both. So that's our proper, uh, and this is the magnitude limits uh, function of year over there. Uh, you know, it's quite a massive camera. Um, it basically uh, weighs several tons. It, the, 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 the optics was assembled in our basement, my colleague Peter Doll. Uh, five lenses have to be, they have to be uh, polished and aligned to half the width of that page. You know, I learned to appreciate what instrumentation people do. It's quite uh, challenging. Um, uh, this is the UCL Provost, by the way, in case you wonder. And here it is. I should say money for this came from STFC initially, 1.7, and from other rich universities, such as the University of Portsmouth. And uh, this is the instrument on, on, the, on the telescope uh, at the inauguration ceremony in November. Um, this is one of the first images. So, so there are 64 uh, uh, CCDs. If you think it's 570 megapixels, so it's about you know, 100 times more than your typical uh, iPhone camera, okay? But it weighs much more. Uh, so that's what you see. And here is, this is just one of the first pointing Fornix cluster. And here's this galaxy you can zoom in. If you get to the Fermilab website for the press release, you just put an interactive exercise that you can click and see each object and it tells you what it is. So it's kind of fun. Um, Early data, uh, seven supernova measured, five of them confirmed as 1A on the AAT, by the way, and there's a new project called OSDES to incorporate the spectroscopy, a new, few new clusters, redshift plus 0.9, mass reconstruction even, from the lensing around the cluster, mass reconstruction, very preliminary, no hard numbers, and also some work led by uh, my postdoc, uh, uh, Manda Banerjee, uh, of actually contrasting DES and, and VISTA uh, hemisphere survey and combining the photometric redshift, for combining the colors to get better uh, photometric redshifts. It's very important to emphasize what type of uncertainty is going to this. One is the uh, theoretical one, right? I mean, how broad is your cosmological model? Um, do you include neutrino or not? Changes to other numbers. Astrophysical, galaxy biasing, does in supernova and so on, and instrumental. So we have to deal with all that. This is the photometric redshift game. Remember, the DES is photometric redshift uh, 
uh, survey, and that's tricky because just from five colors and maybe three more from Vista, you have to tell the redshift, and uh, it degrades, you know, uncertainty in redshift degrades W by a factor. Uh, you know, so you need to know the redshift. If you want uh, uh, 1% in W, you need to know the redshift at the level of 0.2%, I think. And that's why we need spectroscopy, okay? Uh, shear measurements, cosmic shear is a whole complicated area because apart from the gravitational lensing, you have the atmosphere in the way and a detector and so on. If you like, here is my 1% rule from DS. It's a 1% effect. You want to measure it to 1% to get W to 1%, okay? So this is the most challenging task. Of course, everything is going to get better. That's all about the yes. We'll update you in the future. Uh, of course, in, in along these lines, it's a pretty good idea to put a space a telescope in space to, to do um, to, to do lensing. I mean, for example, is a clash clash survey for HST that shows beautiful 25 clusters. You can do it almost whole sky, or 15,000 square degree of the extragalactic sky, one billion galaxies, and also spectroscopy. So that's for Euclid. Uh, moving to spectroscopy, there's a bit of history there from just measuring spectrum of a galaxy one by one to doing it as a multi-spectrograph uh, approach. The UK really pioneered uh, some of it. Uh, there have been several proposals which didn't quite get off the ground, WFMOS, Big Boss, DESPEC, but the news is that DOE is happy to support now a union of Big Boss and DSPEC, and uh, we just had a collaboration meeting in July Director is Michael Levy from LBL, and uh, yesterday we made a presentation to um, SPFC. Uh, foremost, which is on Vista, and uh, there's, I know uh, people in, many people in Europe are interested in that, including in Cambridge, and the idea is to do Gaia follow-up, and uh, Erosita Weave is to do, again, Gaia. Uh, Samiri PFS, that's a Jap Japanese project on, on Subaru Euclid I mentioned. And it seems like, you know, this of interest is now uh, cosmology and um, galactic archaeology. The DESI uh, project will, will produce, it's using 5,000 fibers, so if you remember 2DF had 400, uh, about 20 million targets over, you know, big chunk of the sky, and the object will be LRGs, luminous red galaxies, emission line galaxies, quasars, and Lyman alpha quasars. That's, that's a very exciting because you can do cosmology with that. Um, many different goals here, and there's you no know, MCMC, MCMC machinery, in this case run by Pat McDonald, for the Ws and the other parameters that we've seen uh, uh, in, the, in the Planck talks. Maybe I'll just draw your attention that it looks pretty uh, promising for neutrino mass, subject to all the assumptions. But to give you an idea, when we did neutrino from 2DF, the upper limit was 1.8 EV. Cu upper limits before Planck combined with CMB at the time, but mainly from LRG, papers by our group and other groups, uh, BOSS is about 0.25, or let's call it 0.3 EV. Uh, Planck, if you take its face value, is 0.23 EV. This is going down by a factor of 10, 0.02. So the easy way, easiest way to remember this is it's 10 times better than BOSS. Okay, it's got in terms of fibers, in terms of uh, improvement on parameters, 10 times better. Um, quickly, should you have uh, surveys, spectroscopy from just some, some, some part of the sky, this is also a political decision, where you put telescopes. Just to mention, there have been quite a number of papers about it. It's all quite interesting. There was a bit of a controversy in the literature of results disagreeing in the range between 1 to 100. So we called the telecon on that. We had a meeting, and I think it's now more converging to the level of little improvement to factor of two in figure of merit. This is uh, from work by, led by a postdoc of mine, Donica Kirk. And the idea is to take something like DS and something like DESI, take weak lensing and, and, um, and um, a large scale structure. So you see the blue is, sorry, start with the green. Green is just weak lensing. This is W0, WA, yeah? Uh, the dark energy uh, figure of merit. Um, black is uh, just large scale structure from the essay. But now if you do both, even if they're not on same power of the sky, there's huge improvement. And if you do it on same power of the sky, even more, that's the blue one. 
And you can do the same thing, so it's not very clear, but this is some combination of these Q and R parameters, which if they are one is star GR, if not, if not you deviate. And actually for modified gravity, this QR parameterization is even, looks even more impressive. It's this combination I mentioned that one lensing constraint, the sum of potentials and large scale structure, only one of them. Uh, I'd like to almost finish with two health warnings. One is people do a lot of Fisher matrices, but they don't always give the same answer as MCMC. They don't always give the same answer as MCMC. This is, this is a result from a group in Munich supernova, so you know, nice ellipses are, uh, for whatever parameters, so I won't go into details, nice ellipses are Fisher matrices, second derivatives likelihood, and the funny contours are MCMC. This is from our group, former PhD student Adam Hawken. Again, ellipses are nice, but you can see MCMC for small volumes gives different answers. So I think, you know, uh, it's good to do both, of course, but we have to be a bit careful. The other thing, and this was actually a question I asked George at the end of his talk. But I feel comfortable, we're scratching our head. We actually, have a, I have a student, Lucy Calder, who's working on this. How many nuisance parameters are we going to put? Because we're trying to fit the whole universe with six to 12 parameters. But then my young, ambitious colleagues who love to run MCMC, you know, they take, give me a list of a thousand nuisance parameters, you know? And some of them are correlated with cosmology. So I'm a bit nervous about it. So we're trying to take perhaps a more modest astrophysical approach, for example, for biasing to find a generic model which agrees with simulations with only a few parameters and try that. This is going to be the approach. Uh, there's also some ideas using PCA to compress them a bit. But uh, that's, uh, and that's a summary. Uh, and so I just want to say, reading of the situation is W constant minus one is not ruled out by the data, okay? It's, it's at the moment, perfectly, I think, especially with Planck, uh, looks perfectly valid. You know, tell on your undergraduates and public folk, it's a pretty good number. Uh, but uh, uh, W is a function of redshift and modified gravity, uh, such like those two potentials, are not yet ruled out. If you like, gravity has not been tested on the very big scales. I emphasize, on the other hand, that maybe there's some scope to learn about it on the megaparsec scale. Um, but there is a lot to come from this surveys. Within, just within cosmology, I would say detection of neutrino mass seems to be, we heard it almost every talk, uh, observational talk in this meeting mentioned neutrino mass. I think it's very exciting. How to deal with nuisance prompting is a challenge. We need, I think, methodology there. Uh, I mentioned two projects close to my heart, but there are only two out of uh, a dozen or so, but you can see the timeline, DS starting basically 2018 and then Euclid after 2020, maybe the most kind of closing with, again, kind of philosophical remark, are we going to experience another paradigm shift in our lifetime? You know, I feel very fortunate. I came to Cambridge, it was 4% 4, 4 baryons, 96% called dark matter. And I was told it's fine not to understand one component. And then, Again, then the history of that does not, by the way, start with supernova. I, th I believe it starts with APM and clusters and so on. The decade before, there was this major paradigm shift. Unfortunately, the young people in the audience have not experienced paradigm shift, you know? So I wish you <laughs> to experience it in your lifetime, to actually see that somebody will say, look, it's not lambda, something completely different, and this will also keep theoreticians busy. So thanks very much. Thank you for a great talk and keeping to time. Um, we've got time for questions. So, uh, I'll, I wanted to tackle Lucas's last point about nuisance parameters yep. and so on. I mean, the um, you know a, a lot of observational astronomers have you know been you know quite upset with my attitude to the, to their data. Um, you know, and th but the thing is, that there's a very substantive point. We, we work very hard in Planck to understand our chi-squares. You know, after fitting, we include the nuisance parameters that we think are, are actually relevant. And you've, you've no choice about that. Right? Yeah. You, 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 yeah. you have to include nuisance parameters. And then you have to look at how they couple with cosmology and so on. And so the good thing from the CMB is 
you know, there's a very weak coupling. So when you get to, to quite difficult models, um, you know, that are highly degenerate in the CMB, it starts to become important. And that, that is a fact of life. And I think it's important that people understand that there are those dependencies there. But with the with Planck, we got chi-squareds, you know, reduced chi-squareds, very close to unity. We understand our statistics. So that's not true of any of the other astrophysical data sets. Okay, so supernovae, and no understanding of chi-squareds, no proper understanding of nuisance parameters, you know, Hubble constants, Cepheids, even worse, okay, and so on and so on. Every data set, astrophysical data set, the chi-squareds, you know, are not understood. And so when we go into the era of precision, further precision, you have to tackle these problems. And then that determines, you know, what you do with nuisance parameters. You have to understand yeah. your chi-squares. Yeah. And if you don't, yeah. then why should we believe them um, and fold in likelihoods, you know, with anomalous chi-squares? So you agree it needs, needs attention. When you talk about the physical motivator parameters to fit different data and everything, also there is a, uh, a lot of difficulty here because you can choose these parameters quite freely. And uh, even if they are very different, uh, the physical motivation can be the same, but you're going to have really different values. Right. There are also many correlations that right. can affect your results. So how to constrain to um, more or less universal yeah. parameters that you can compare with other yeah. people. Well, so there is a formalism. There are some experts in the audience. Uh, model selection, you, you, if that's what you're after, if I understood you correctly, that you can have, you know, say, dark energy model, W0, WA, and, and uh, modified gravity model with 10 parameters. How do you compare, even if the chi-square happens to be the same, almost, which is the, how do you compare? Uh, so there's a, a machinery of model selection, which has to, called Bayesian evidence, uh, the, it's a denominator in Bayes' theorem, and there's quite an interesting debate in the literature on how useful that is in cosmology. Okay, formally it's correct, it's also very demanding computationally, but there is a, a discussion in the literature. So I think that's another issue, okay, is how to contrast, you know, should you add I don't know, another type of neutrino to your analysis? How would it, would it improve the chi-square, but what's the penalty? So there, there is a statistical literature on that. Final question, anyone? Okay, brilliant talk. Thank you very Thank much you. again. Okay, it's a pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Lam Hu from Columbia, who's going to talk on testing gravity. So uh, when, while I was preparing for the talk, I uh, realized perhaps a better title for this talk is the following. It's uh, Symmetries and Testing Gravity. And then uh, upon further reflection, decided in fact an even better title is uh, Broken Symmetries and Testing Gravity. And broken means explicit and spontaneous. Uh, and you will see why. 
So here is the outline. In fact, in, uh, it's really three different ideas wrapped in one talk, but they are all tied together under the heading of gravity and symmetries. Uh, the first idea is the, is the part that is actually addressing uh, basically theories of modified, uh, modified gravity. And I want to discuss kind of a, a fairly generic test. And it's a small scale test of modified gravity that kind of complements uh, this large scale test that uh, Ofer just discussed. Um, the rest of the talk has nothing to do with modified gravity, it's pure general relativity. And I want to discuss symmetry issues in two different aspects of large scale structure. One is symmetry issue in the measurement of large scale structure. And in particular, the symmetry I want to focus on is parity. And then the last part of the talk, I want to discuss symmetry, not so much in the measurement, but more like uh, in the theory of large scale structure. You will see the distinction in a moment. And the symmetries in questions has to do with dilation and generalization thereof, which I'll describe. Uh, my collaborators are listed here, Alberto Nicolis, my colleague at Columbia, Camille Bonfin, and uh, Enrique Castaneda. Camille is actually in the audience, I believe. And then uh, my, I have a fairly large set of collaborators in the last topic. Um, so let me begin with the first idea. And I should also say, as we progress, we are marching backward in time to larger redshift and also larger scales, as you will see. The first idea, um, let me make just some fairly uh, basic remarks about modified gravity. Uh, there is a theorem that actually puts uh, fairly severe constraints for any attempts to modify gravity. Uh, and the theorem is due to Weinberg and Dessa and also and others. And the theorem can be fairly simply stated. At low energies, which means large distance scales for us, a Lorentz invariant theory of a massless spin two particle must be general relativity. And therefore, by that theorem, in fact, we should just forget about modifying gravity because it's impossible. You shouldn't do it. Uh, the, only, the only way around respecting this theorem, really, is to just add extra forces, not the one that is uh, mediated by the mass that's been to a particle. The simplest way to do it is to introduce a scalar. For example, it's fairly common. A light scalar that mediates long-range force between matter particles. In other words, you end up having basically some version of scalar tensor theory, where the scalar is this extra scalar mediating a long-range force, and the tensor part is just good OGR. Uh, a, a more non-trivial example would be, I think uh, Claudia would discuss that next, would be massive gravity. Uh, it's a very exciting theory. Uh, there has been some exciting development recently. And even in that case, uh, by adding a mass to the graviton, which basically violates one of the assumptions here, if you like, uh, you add extra polarization states, and it turns out one of them, in certain limits, behave like a scalar. And uh, therefore, again, once again, some kind of scalar tensor theory. What I want to just uh, um, emphasize at the beginning is somehow some kind of scalar tensor theory seems to be fairly generic if you want to modify gravity at all. Second motivation, I, just, I thought I should just mention, if you like to think about anything beyond the cosmological constant, for example, some kinds of dark energy, usually some light scalar, sometimes called quintessence, absent symmetries that forbid it, that scalar would be coupled to matter. And as long as it does, again, that mediates a long range force. Once again, some kind of scalar tensor theory. So from that point of view, if you want to uh, follow this way of thinking, which you don't have to, uh, but let's say you follow this way of thinking, some kind of scalar tensor theory is actually fairly generic. And it would be very useful to have a generic test, kind of uh, in some sense independent of the details of that theory, which is more like, yeah, which is very much a work in construction. Um, so here's the idea. Uh, I should say, I should have put a reference here. The idea is actually pretty old uh, due to NODVET uh, in the 60s. The idea is the following. Let's assume, and I want to emphasize assume because this is not always true, but very often it's true. Let's assume black holes have no hair, in particular no scalar hair, meaning no scalar charge. While normal stars like the sun actually have scalar charge. In that case, the black holes would not actually, if you have a background scalar field, the black hole would not fall according to that scalar field, whereas a normal star would. And therefore, in the same environment, 
the black hole would fall slower than the star. Of course, both of them have the normal GR gravity part, so that part caused them to fall at the same rate, but the scalar part of the theory would cause the black hole not to fall as fast as the star. And in general, if the scalar matter coupling is gravitational in strength, that difference is order one, it's not small. And uh, I should also emphasize this limit is uh, presumably continuous, which means if you take the charge to mass ratio, scale them in the right way, uh, for, for the sun, for example, it will be one, let's say, and as you take your object to be more and more compact, it will go to zero. So it's a smooth limit, but let's focus on black holes. Now, in the past, this effect would be hopeless to detect. That's why not so much attention has been paid to this idea, because the classic scalar tensor theory is the brand sticky theory, and solar system tests already very strongly constrained brand sticky uh, theory. It tells us that that scalar must be extremely weakly coupled to matter, much weaker than gravitational strength, and therefore, you shouldn't, you shouldn't expect to see any big effects because the scalar force is so much weaker than the gravitational force. So even though the black hole has no scalar charge, who cares? Very small effect. Uh, Reason versions of scalar tensor theories uh, motivated by DGP, massive gravity, and so on, uh, at some level offers, offers some, some, uh, a hope that you might be able to see this effect. Because in these theories, uh, sometimes by construction and sometimes actually by the nature of those theories, uh, they pass solar system tests, meaning the uh, orbital motion of planets around the sun has a very little deviation from GR, yet they have interesting order one effects elsewhere, in particular on cosmological scales, it has to have order one effects for it, for it to be interesting in terms of explaining cosmic acceleration. And so these theories have more structure that allows you to somehow satisfy solar system tests yet have interesting effects elsewhere, and that's what I want to address. Uh, and um, I think Claudia might I hope we we'll discuss a little bit more about uh, screening mechanisms, uh, which I won't go into in detail, which means I'll skip this slide. Uh, so let me go to the idea, it's actually very simple. Let's con consider a, uh, some, there's some large scale structure in this neighborhood of this galaxy, and that large scale structure sources some gravitational field. And it sources the normal GR gravitational field plus the scalar gravitational field and the scalar gradient, uh, the scalar profile is represented by this, by this wave, basically. Uh, galaxies would fall according to that gravitational field and scalar field generated by large scale structure. And it's going to fall in this direction, let's say. Now we know galaxies very often uh, have a uh, massive black hole at the center. And now uh, it becomes a, a very uh, natural question to ask, how would that black hole fall compared to the rest of the galaxy? Remember we said earlier, the black hole should experience normal gravitational force but zero scalar force, whereas the rest of the galaxies, dark matter and stars, would experience both. And therefore the black hole should fall slower. And therefore you expect over time this is what's, this is what's going to happen. Uh, the black hole would get displaced. Now, naively, you might think the black hole would just leave the galaxy altogether. Actually, that won't happen. Over time, it will reach some kind of equilibrium because of the following. Um, if you look at the mass enclosed in the central region of the galaxy, that gives this black hole an additional pull. That compensates for the lack of the scalar force on the black hole. So over time, it will reach an equilibrium, and the equilibrium is determined by just two things. One is the strength of this external scalar force, and two, the central density, mass density of the galaxy. The balance of the two tells you where you reach equilibrium. And, and, uh, and you would know, and you, you can expect the equilibrium offset would be the smallest if the central density is small, right? If the central density is large, you only would be offset by very little before that additional pool would compensate for the lack of scalar force. Okay, so this is the simple idea, and you can estimate that offset. Uh, we did a very simple 
estimate. Um, so just to repeat, the idea is to look for offset of massive black holes from centers of galaxies and where by centers, let me be a little bit more precise, I mean the bottom of the gravitational potential well. It won't be actually sitting there. Absent this effect, dynamical friction in general, given enough time, would take the supermassive black hole to the bottom. But this effect would actually displace it from the bottom. And uh, a, s a good set of objects to look at would be Seifert galaxies, where you can actually see both the stars and the black hole because the active nucleus of these galaxies are not too bright. You want to see both. The offset has a range. It depends on the kind of galaxies. Uh, for small galaxies, where the central density also tends to be, uh, to be small, um, the offset can be up to about 100 parsecs. Okay, I should mention though, there are of course astrophysical effects that could mimic this one. And so I list a few here. Uh, number one, the black hole at the center could have, uh, often have jets and in fact, the jets need not be symmetric. And in fact, that seems to be the explanation for the one offset that we know, which is M87. The offset in that case is about reported to be about seven parsec. In the image, you can actually see the jets and the offset seems consistent with the direction of those jets. So this seems like a good explanation in that case. And in fact, you could actually work out just as a, a simple exercise. If this offset were due to this effect, some kind of modified gravity effect, the, this, the coupling of the scalar to matter has to be a lot stronger than gravity actually. So from that point of view, it's also an unlikely explanation. Uh, there are other effects. Uh, this one is more rare, binary merger recoil. Yeah, when you merge two black holes that happen to be at the center, you know the emission of gravitational waves is asymmetric. That give you a recoil, that would give you an offset. Uh, Brownian motion, the fact that your supermassive black hole is sitting in a bath of stars would basically cause the scattering would cause the black hole to wander. And finally, of course, your black holes, uh, your galax galaxies could be just disturbed, meaning galaxies that just merged not a long time ago, the, the, the black holes could be displaced. So there are all these uh, effects that are uh, sources of confusion, so I'm, I, won't, I won't claim this is easy, but this is something that one could look for and it seems fairly generic. The distinguishing feature is the following that if it were due to this effect that I am uh, suggesting, the, uh, the spatial offset should be correlated with the streaming motion of the galaxy. Whereas most other effects wouldn't have that feature. That's number one. And number two is that this, uh, this offset comes with also a small velocity offset, which means, which, which, which means the, the, the black hole let's say is on the way to moving to its equilibrium position is actually very slow. It's like a few kilometers per second, very slow. Whereas these effects for some of the first two typically give you a, a, a fairly substantial velocity offset. So you should check for velocity offset as well. Uh, of these, probably the one that is uh, most easily confused with, uh, with the effect that we're talking about is probably Brownian motion. Brownian motion is probably small for large galaxies Milky Way like galaxies. Uh, so probably in that case, it won't be confused, but for small galaxies, like what I'm talking about here, the two actually have similar size, okay? So that has, one has to be careful in, in one's interpretation. So that's uh, idea number one, test for the presence of extra scalar forces by looking for off-center black holes. If you like, it's some kind of equivalence, equivalence principle test, okay? And uh, I won't go into these footnotes let me go to the second idea. Now we leave modified gravity, this is just general relativity. Huh? Uh, and I want to discuss uh, the issue of parity or violation of parity in measurement of large scale structure. Uh, in general, when we do measurements, we, we just automatically, even without thinking, assume parity is uh, respected. And for good reason, right? Because let's say, I have these two points. I measure the galaxy two-point correlation function, which is shown here, delta and delta. If I swap the two galaxies, clearly it wouldn't make any difference. So for good reason, if you measure this, you will never see parity violation almost by, almost by definition. Uh, however, how about cross-correlation? What if you 
cross correlate two different populations of galaxies, and I label them here A and B. So A and B here. With two different populations, you can form some kind of an arrow, if you like. I'll define an arrow that points from A to B. And this situation is inherently different from this situation because the, the arrow points in different directions. And in general, one could imagine, at least imagine, that these two measurements will give you a different answer. They need not be the same, although very often we assume even in that case they are the same. Okay? Now you might wonder what kind of effects would actually care about the exchanging the pair of uh, A and B. What kind of effects would, be, would break parity? And uh, here's one, and I'm going to discuss more, but this one is nice because it's very uh, pictorial. So let's think about the following situation. Let's say I have an observer here, and I am looking at um, three galaxies, one, two, and three. And this is very idealized, so uh, bear with me for a moment. Three galaxies sitting in some gravitational potential well. Yeah? This is the shape of the gravitational potential well. The black dot, the black galaxy sitting in the bottom, these two galaxies is sitting uh, the same distance from it, left or right. Yeah. Now let's ask the following questions. When we measure these galaxies, of course, it's positioned along the line of sight. Very often, all we know is the redshift. And there is one component of redshift which is just purely gravitational, gravitational redshift. Now let's add the gravitational redshift of these three objects and see how they would get displaced. This one is in the bottom. This two is in the shallow part of, shallower part of the gravitational potential well. And therefore, they get displaced like this, yes? The, uh, the one that's at the bottom get displaced the most. And now you ask the question, OK, let's, let's uh, find out the relative separation of these three galaxies. What would they look like? Well, it would look like this. The, uh, these two galaxies. Would, have, would be closer together than these two galaxies. Yeah? What was originally a symmetric situation become asymmetric because gravitational redshift worked that way. Peculiar motion, if you think about it, do some kind of average by itself would not do this. Which means the following, which means if you look at these galaxies, and let's, lay, let's give these galaxies label. So I'll do this next. I'll call them. A and B, right? The one sitting in the bottom, let me call that A. The ones out there, let me call that B. For example, you can think of this as a cluster. A is the central brightest galaxies, and Bs are the members. Uh, what this is telling you is that the cross correlation between A and B is stronger if B is behind A than if B is in front of A. You are here, you are the observer here, okay? And uh, this, uh, this effect was, uh, was, uh, I was brilliantly exploited by, uh, by this set of authors about two years ago. Uh, of course, this is a very high idealized cartoonish picture of what's going on. What they did was you average over many clusters. Clusters are by no means symmetric, for, for example. But if you average, you can hope to pull out the signal. And the claim by this author is indeed they pull out a signal at the level of two to three sigma, three sigma, closer to three sigma. This point of view that I advocate here that really one way to think about it is just some kind of cross correlation that is parity asymmetric. It has been actually discussed by a number of authors I listed here. <laughs> some of them are the audience. Okay. Now once you think in this direction, you, uh, it's very natural to ask, well, what are other parity violating effects? And in fact, there are many. Uh, uh, and at least, at least uh, at least uh, a, uh, a large fraction of them is usually grouped under the heading of general relativistic effects. And basically, essentially, uh, they, they work as follows. That the observed fluctuation in galaxy density is equal to the true galaxy density fluctuation multiplied by some kind of correction factor. And you can organize the corrections by basically h over k and h over k squared. These terms are going to be very hard to observe, as you can imagine, uh, because we generally, generally observe structure that are sub-horizon. So these guys are probably the ones that we'll observe first if we 
if, uh, if, if we do observe these, these general relativistic effects. And these effects, because it carries single gradient, they are parity violating. It's basically just because of that. And there have been a lot of work uh, in, in the last several years just uh, working this out, the general relativistic effects. I want to point out there are also more mundane effects that violate parity, and we have known about them all along. The more mundane one is just evolution, no? Because let's say you have an observer here, you are looking at these, again, three galaxies, and clearly the, uh, the correlation function evolved with redshift. The fact that it evolved with redshift means you actually care about whether B is behind A or in front of A at some level, yes? And uh, one, of the, one of the points uh, I want to emphasize is, in fact, you can disentangle between this and perhaps more interesting general relativistic effects, like the ones that I showed in the last slide. Uh, uh, they, are, they are both parity violating, violating, but evolution effects have actually additional, additional uh, features. Uh, evolution effects, in fact, violate translational invariance, if you think about it, because you actually care where you are observing because things evolve, okay? So the fact that it's, uh, it has that additional feature allows you to disentangle between these two things, which is helpful if you want to somehow zero in on the general relativistic effects, okay? So I want to make a number of uh, footnotes. Footnote number one, the, the, the parity validating effects I'm talking about here only care about parity in the redshift direction, okay? Not in the angular directions. In fact, it would be interesting, we, we, we put some thought to it, are there effects actually even in the angular directions? Um, if I have time, maybe I'll talk about it. Footnote number two, uh, these terms, uh, these uh, basically parity violating terms, they can be derived actually in, a, I would say, almost Newtonian manner. Uh, and, and that is kind of nice to see because you can really see where each of these effects come from and uh, it's described in a paper if you're interested. Uh, a detail of that actually turns out to be uh, that the gravitational redshift effect that I described in the last slide, if you assume galaxies move on geodesics, is in fact exactly canceled by other general relativistic effects. However, there are still parity violating effects that remain that can give you interesting parity violation in terms of observations. But the, the gravitational redshift effect per se at least on linear scales, is in fact exactly canceled if you assume galaxies move on geodesics, that they obey Euler equation, okay? Footnote number three, I won't get too much into it. You can also think about basically selection effects that would give you some kind of preference or some kind of uh, preference for directions, okay? But uh, let me not go into that detail. Uh, let me summarize this part of the talk. Lessons for large-scale structure measurements um, the, the basic lesson I want to uh, put forward is that when, when one do measurements of uh, especially cross-correlation functions, don't just add them, these two different diagrams, don't add these two contributions to your two-point function, don't add them. In fact, you might want to subtract them because when you subtract them, you might pull out interesting signals. More generally, what you probably want to do is not just to subtract them and add them, but to combine different orientations appropriately. Because as you can imagine, once you have this effect, the, uh, how the pair is oriented with respect to line of sight actually changes the answer. And you just combine all those orientations in the right way. Um, the gravitational redshift effect that I, I show you, that basically tells you you should combine in a di dipolar way, okay? But let me pose a question. Given this understanding, it's kind of very natural to ask and uh, see See what you think. Do we similarly need to cross-correlate multiple populations like in two-point function to see parity violating effects in higher endpoint functions? That's the question for you. Do we need to do the same? Multiple populations, if I want to look for parity violating effects in higher endpoint functions? Yes or no? What do you think? Okay, if you, if you think about it a little bit, the answer is no, you don't need to. And uh, one way to convince yourself is again to draw cartoons. Uh, you draw triangles. Even if you have three, uh, uh, let's say three-point function and you have galaxies, all same population now, 
I call them A. This triangle need not be the same as that triangle. And, um, and in fact, so basically the general statement is, if you want to look for parity violating effect in high endpoint functions, in fact, even just autocorrelations suffice, in fact. And once again, if you want to do this, uh, pull, it, pull, the, pull out the general relativistic signal out of uh, high endpoint functions, you should somehow combine basically triangle rotated basically respect to the line of sight in some particular fashion in order to pull out the signal, okay? So summary for the, for the, for the second idea, there are interesting parity violating effects in measurement of large scale structure. At a two point level, you need, thank you, you need cross correlation, okay? However, at the high end point level, auto correlation would just work. So that's summary two. Okay, L lastly, uh, symmetries in the theory of large scale structure. So let me try to make some connection between this part and the second part of the talk. Uh, let's say I'm interested in some kind of endpoint function, right? Delta observed at point one, at point two, and so on. Yeah, I can think of this as basically an integral over the field configuration with some probability distribution. I write it as d to the minus s to suggest some kind of path interval, but it's just some probability, if you like. And in the second part of the talk, what I focus on is the following, is violation of parity because of what you observe, which is basically the nature of the observables that causes the parity violation. Of course, there's no fundamental parity violations unless we live in a strange universe. Uh, in the theory, which is basically this part, the probability distribution of delta itself, okay? Whereas now, in this part of the talk, I want to focus on uh, symmetries actually in the theory part, actually in this part, not so much on violations that somehow comes from the definition of observables, okay? And in particular, I want to focus on uh, non-linearly realized symmetries, and by non-linearly realized, I, means the I mean the following where the field of interest, often called pi, representing pi on, but you can think of this as any large scale structure observable. Um, if under the symmetry of interest, pi transform like so, that pi experience a shift, and the shift I call C, but it doesn't have to be a constant. The main requirement is that shift is independent of pi. And this is what we mean by a nonlinear, a nonlinearly realized symmetry as if it's associated with uh, some kind of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And uh, we know uh, that there are actually very powerful theorems, uh, sometimes called low energy theorems, sometimes called uh, soft fan theorems, that relate n plus one point function to n point function, and the relationship looks something like this, very schematic, okay? Where I'm interested in some kind of n point function, let's say, with momenta, K1 up to Km. So this is a product of observables at those momenta. That correlation function is in fact related to the same correlation function with an additional leg, which is the pion, which is supposedly at soft momenta. You have to take the Q, the momentum of the pion to zero. And these are fairly powerful theorems. They are non-perturbative. And um, the question, the, so, so what you want to do is to ask, you know, in our theories of, uh, of large scale structure uh, or perturbations from inflation, what kind of symmetries of this sort exist for which you can write down this kind of relation. This kind of relation is often called consistency relations. Uh, there have been a lot of work recently, I listed only some of them that kind of take this kind of point of view about consistency relations some of the authors are in the audience. Okay, so let me show you an example of such a nonlinearly realized symmetry, which is the easiest to understand, and it was uh, first uh, discussed by Modesena. And let's uh, take the co-moving gauge, which means I'm gonna take a gauge in which the equal time surface are surface in which the inflaton has zero fluctuations. The spatial part of the metric is like so, with the scale factor, e to the zeta, 
theta parametrize uh, the, the scalar perturbations, is, is basically the curvature perturbations. Gamma is the tensor perturbations. Okay, so this is the spatial part of the metric. So what is this dilation symmetry that I'm talking about? This dilation symmetry is the fact that if I rescale my coordinate x by this factor, where lambda is just a constant, clearly I can, I can actually uh, absorb it by shifting zeta. Yeah? If I shift zeta by lambda here, I can absorb this additional factor that, it, that, hap that, that occurs when I rescale the coordinates. And the fact that zeta experience this nonlinear shift is this uh, phenomenon of uh, nonlinearly realized symmetries I was talking about. So there, here in this example, zeta plays the role of the pion, and you can work out uh, precisely what kind of uh, soft pion relation or consistency relation you expect, and it looks like this. And it was first discussed by Madasena, okay, where let's say uh, endpoint function of zeta taken suitable derivatives thereof is related to endpoint function of zeta plus one more, which is the soft, the soft zeta, okay? And it has to be divided by the power spectrum of zeta itself, okay? I should also emphasize, yes, thank you. I should also emphasize this relation is in fact more general than this, meaning this bunch of observables, z products of zeta can be other things. Doesn't have to be zeta themselves, okay? Um, what, uh, what one of the recent developments in the last two years or so is, is, uh, is, is the realization, in fact, there are generalization of this. This one basically takes rescale x, but in fact, you can take x and add a, add a piece that goes like power law in x, okay? Which actually creates uh, a nonlinear shift in zeta that is some kind of power law uh, power law in, 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 in X, where M here I'm writing very schematically. It's some kind of tensor. There's some kind of tensor uh, contraction that I'm not displaying. And similarly, tensor also experience such a nonlinear shift. And you can just work out in general what is the consistency relation, and it looks like so. And the perhaps the, the slightly surprising thing, which in retrospect is not so surprising, is that there's in fact an infinite number of these. Not just, not just dilation. The, the next one, uh, which is basically n equals one, is, uh, turns out to be uh, special conformal transformation. And then the higher order ones, they, they just go on and on for arbitrary n, okay? Uh, I want to make a few remarks about these consistency relations. Number one, these symmetries, if you think about it, let's look at this one, is really just good old diffeomorphism, right? And so these are, these are gauge symmetries, which might lead one to think these are basically completely empty statements. However, they are not, because we know these relations can in fact be violated in certain theories, like in, for example, the th theory where the initial conditions uh, is determined by some curvaton, curvaton fluctuations. So if you like, these consistency relations, one way to think about them is they are, in, they, are, they are a test of initial conditions, okay? And these relations are satisfied when the initial conditions correspond to basically that from a single clock, okay? Basically the simplest, uh, the simplest uh, inflation models, okay? So that's, that's point number one. Point number two, uh, these relations are non perturbative meaning in principle, these zeta can have large values very high K. Now, of course, uh, from the point of view of inflation, that's not so interesting because our fluctuations are small anyway. However, from the point of view of large scale structure, these relations might be very interesting because we don't have a lot of handles on, on, uh, on nonlinear clustering. These statements somehow tells you something that is supposed to be non perturbative because these are symmetry statements about observables, and I emphasize here, it doesn't have to be zeta. It can be actually anything. Uh, only the soft pion has to be zeta itself. Uh, that can be at very high K, and it's supposed to work. Uh, testing these, uh, uh, and so 
perhaps these relations should give us uh, some theoretical guidance on developing understanding of clustering on nonlinear scales. And I, I so also should emphasize the, the observables here doesn't even have to be related to mass in a simple way. They could be something related to galaxies or halos. As long as physics is local, this kind of relation should still work. Uh, the wrinkle in my, in, my, uh, in, my, uh, in my argument here is that these relations, unfortunately, they are general relativistic in nature, meaning to really verify them, you have to include general relativistic effects, which makes it hard. Uh, interestingly, recently it was realized by this set of authors. In fact, there are further consistency relations, at least one more, that you can derive even at the Newtonian level. You don't need general relativity. Uh, you don't need to be able to see general relativistic effect to verify that relation. And I think it's a very interesting uh, development. Maybe there are others we can write down. Would they be helpful in uh, helping us understand nonlinear clustering? That remains to be seen. Uh, so this is the summary of the last part of the talk. Nonlinearly realized symmetries in large scale structure give non perturbative relations between different endpoint functions. There are, in fact, an infinite number of such symmetries. They are tests of initial condition. They might help us develop a better understanding of nonlinear clustering. And so I will end by just flashing the outline at the very beginning because uh, I realize it might be a little bit confusing to talk about three different things in one talk. So this is my, this is my summary. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you for a thought-provoking talk. Talks. Uh, so there's time for questions. So I just wanted to um, basically ask something or, or draw, raise a point about the very first part of your the talk. First part, yes. You're making a huge assumption there that the black hole just doesn't do anything with the scalar field. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's, so most of the no hair theorems make incredibly restrictive assumptions. They're assuming that you're static and spherically symmetric. Mm. But as soon as you break that, I mean, black holes do interact with dynamical scalar fields. They do respond to them. Nice. So I, I, I don't really f sort of find you know, that particular test that convincing because I think you've got to know mm -hmm. how your black hole responds to a much dirtier situation with a more complicated scalar field. I mean, we know that black holes, in fact, do carry non-trivial um, scalar profiles, mm -hmm. you know, in the case, well, in, in the case of chameleons, you know, in the case of, uh, yes, they do. Yes, they do. You will see the paper, <laughs> you know. I they haven't do. seen the paper. They, they do. They <laughs> carry non-trivial scalar profiles. You mean with, with time-varying scalar field? You need no, to be, have no, some special profile? Not even profile? with time-varying scalar fields. But you, not even without time-varying scalar fields. Do you need spatial variation across, uh, across the... Uh, uh, you, you need spatial variation at the boundary condition? No, in what way spatial variation? Uh, no, not really, no. No, if I've understood you. Well, then that's inconsistent correct. with Bekenstein's theorem. There's a um, theorem by Bekenstein. No, I'm afraid the no hair theorem simply don't apply in that case. For chameleons, I would think so. No, they don't. For Galileans, I, no. No, we can prove that they do not. I have, I have, so to, I have to see the paper. Yeah. But let me, let me address your question. I agree with you 100% that you can write down theories where black holes have scalar hair. I mean, those examples exist. Uh, by and large, most of the models that I'm aware of that are under discussion in the context of uh, cosmic acceleration. You can prove no hair theorems for them. For example, uh, Alberto Nicolis and I prove a theorem for Galileans. Uh, let me give you a, uh, a, an intuitive argument for why we expect this to work in general, although once again, there are exceptions. So here's the argument. Let's say you have a scalar that is uh, sourced, by, uh, sourced by basically the trace of the matter timuli. Okay. Now let's ask, what is the charge, scalar charge to mass ratio for a given astronomical object? Okay. 
the scalar charge is only determined by the volume integral of that trace, whereas the mass of the object is determined by that contribution from the matter T mu nu and the gravitational binding energy. So the mass have two sources where the charge have only one. And therefore, when you go to very compact objects where the mass start to be dominated by gravitational binding energy, the charge to mass ratio would diminish. And the no hair theorem is just a statement that this limit is in fact continuous, that you go to a black hole, does not somehow suddenly jump. Now, you can build theories where that actually happens, but it's, uh, I would say is somewhat unexpected at least. Just that simple argument suggests to you, well, if I look at compact objects, charge to mass ratio should be small. Well, I'd like to talk to you afterwards, but I think, first of all, I agree that matter does couple differently, but I would also point out that I think there are a lot of misunderstandings and misuses of the no-hair theorems, and, and I think that the situation is a lot more complicated, and in particular, when you do have dynamics or you have fe scalar fields with unusual potentials, mm -hmm. then you do get scalar condensation. I mean, string theorists have known this for a long time. Yeah, I should also say there are examples uh, in more mundane theories covered by actually Bekenstein theorem where you can give actually the, the, the black hole uh, some kind of scalar charge is by having some kind of time varying scalar field, for example. This is uh, Ted Jacobson. But in general, the charge to mass ratio you get is just small. I mean, unless you're talking about very oh, large variations. So I don't, yeah. Okay, I think we should move on, and perhaps Ruth and I should talk to you later. Um, Tom, oh, okay. So, uh, well, I also have an example with the scalar field. So let's imagine mm -hmm. uh, you have a black hole and a global monopole, which, has, which is well known to have a deficit angle, mm -hmm. and in the black hole swallows global mo the global monopole, it's obviously what's going to remain is deficit angle, and this is something that you can measure, for example, by deflection of light, so as an additional effect. So that's in some sense hair, right, because it's a, it's a global effect. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You comment on that? Or yeah, I'm not familiar with that solution, so I'm not sure. I have anything intelligent to say. Well, I mean, the argument is very intuitive and simple. Mm -hmm. You have a global monopole which mm -hmm. has a deficit angle that is tends to be So when the black hole heats it up, so mm -hmm. it must remain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Causally, it must right. be there. Right. Right. Uh, any more questions? Or well, perhaps we can thank Lam again. Lots of seats for those people who are sort of um, crouching at the back. Don't all move at once. Well, it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Heidi Duran from Case Western, on dark energy and modified gravity. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. Is that better now? A little bit? Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, be back in Cambridge, and thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak. So now that you're all locked uh, in the room, I'm actually not going to talk too much about dark energy and modified gravity, but really about my own models of modified gravity. Um, and I don't... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also going to show you some pictures of my baby, etc. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we heard um, how to test gra uh, gravity, and actually gravity is just doing amazingly well. In, in all the scales we can think of probing it, it's just flying, passing with flying colors. So you might wonder why you really want to modify gravity. 
Um, well, one thing is if you say that gravity is doing amazingly well, it, it's good to have a comparison. It's good to, to see another theory which is not doing amazingly well, maybe, or have an alternative, and that's what I will provide. Um, but mainly I will provide some theoretical motivations for this alternative. And of course, they're not coming out of the blue. They're mainly coming from um, the consideration of observations of late time, uh, the universe, particularly the, the late time acceleration of the universe, and actually mainly the cosmological constant problem. And I will take the approach of whether it could be that this observation, this observation, or the cosmological constant problem actually comes from the first time of the breaking down of the theory of general relativity on large distance scales. That's why I'm going to specify theories of modified gravity in the infrared, and specifically um, massive gravity, but not uniquely. So when it comes to the cosmological constant problem, or dark energy versus uh, um, the cosmological constant problem, I'm going to remain uh, a little bit agnostic and uh, leave Cliff be the, the Napoleon here. And I'll show you that whether you want to take dark energy or a cosmological constant or anything in between or anything else, well, modified gravity and specifically massive gravity is the guy for you, so uh, just stick with me. Um, if you really want to have the acceleration of the universe being sourced by some kind of dark energy, new degrees of freedom. You can think of these degrees of freedom as just arising from the matter sector, and that's just fine. Um, and they can have their own natural realization or not. But you can also think of them as coming from the dark, uh, from the dark sector of gravity. And there are some models like DGP, which is maybe observational rollout now, but there are models of massive gravity of FFR. And in some of these models, it's not clear whether the degrees of freedom are really intrinsically from the gravitational sector or more from a matter sector, just gravity with some extra scalar fields. But theories of modified gravity, specifically the, these two uh, theories here, come in hand with degrees of freedom which actually want to accelerate the universe uh, by themselves. So already in the dark energy sector, you can uh, see that modified gravity could have some implications. Now, if you really want to take the cosmological constant as your source for the acceleration of the universe, this is great, but you're also faced with the all cosmological constant problem, which is why is the amount of energy density we see as accelerating the universe is 120 orders of magnitude smaller than the Planck scale. And I should say it's not really fair to say that this is just a problem with the cosmological constant. And most of the time when we put some extra degrees of freedom in the dark, energy sector to accelerate the universe, we make such a tuning as well. Uh, for instance, if we want a um, uh, quintessence scalar field, the mass of this field will typically be of this order of magnitude, uh, not to give too much back reaction. Um, and that's the case as well in massive gravity, for instance, that the mass of the graviton that we would want to accelerate the universe, if we wanted to accelerate the universe, would need to be 120 orders of magnitude smaller than the Planck scale. Um, in the case of massive gravity, it is a tuning, but it is a technically natural tuning in the sense that if you consider another particle, massive particle, and you look at the loop from this particle, the effects it has on the running of the graviton mass, it will be proportional to the graviton mass itself in such a way that it is a stable tuning to set the graviton mass to be small. And this is actually not something um, that we expect. It's something that we have now proven uh, with our, a few other people in specific theories of massive gravity. And then this is different from, the, for instance, setting the vacuum energy to zero, because we expect, or we, we can compute, uh, the contribution from massive particle at one loop or any loop to the vacuum energy. And we see that they contribute with the mass of this particle to the four. So it's not a stable tuning to set the vacuum energy to zero. And that's why, even though there's a tuning in both cases, in cases of massive gravity, this tuning might be a technically natural tuning, a technically um, stable tuning as opposed to technically unstable tuning. And the main motivation I started working on massive gravity, and I'm not going to talk too much about that uh, today, but that was one of the main motivations, something we still have in the back of our mind, is that in massive gravity or in theories of modified gravity in the infrared, you might have the opportunity to be able to have the vacuum energy as large as you would want it to be and have its effect being small, um, or have its back reaction on the geometry to be small um, due to the modification of gravity in the infrared. So this is something which hasn't been fully worked out. I don't know right now if there's ever going to be a solution within this direction, but this is, that was one of the motivations behind it. And this is the idea behind degravitation, where we're filtering out the effect of a cosmological constant. 
So that's the motivation for modifying gravity. Um, now we know that uh, gravity is a beautiful theory. And theoretically, it's extremely well motivated and it's extremely difficult to modify it, as Lam was mentioning uh, before. There's actually some uh, theorems that tell you that gravity is the unique theory of a massless spin to field. So in order to modify gravity as little um, as, a, as possible or to still remain theoretically um, in a viable theory, let me start with 5D theory of general relativity and then let me see how I can get different theories in, in four-dimensional gravity, which will be theories of modified gravity, but the symmetry is present in 5D gravity and the, the amount of degrees of freedom that you have in 5D gravity will allow you to ensure that your four-dimensional uh, setup you get out of it is theoretically viable. The first one I will start with is Galileo's. This is not a theory of modified gravity, but it's a theory of 4D gravity with some uh, scalar degrees of freedom there, which have some specific consequences. And in particular, they, allow, they, they come in with a, their own special screening mechanism that uh, Lam talked about. In this case, it's a Weinstein mechanism. And then I will briefly mention the DGP model as arising from 5D gravity, but not really uh, talk too much about it, and I will focus on mm -hmm. theories of hard mass gravity and see how they can arise from 5D gravity and see how actually they look in some limit as Galilean theories and how the Weinstein mechanism inherited from Galilean theory applies to a massive gravity and see some consequences mainly theoretical of that. So let me start with 5D gravity. And not only actually 5D gravity, but something else that I can add in 5D is some love lock invariants. In 5D, I also have a gas bonnet term, which is non-trivial. Um, and if I don't really want to live, I know we're not living in 5D, so let me stick a brain within this 5D and say that we're going to be living on, on this brain. Uh, the brain is localized at some position pi of x. This is going to be the brain bending mode. And if I add a brain bending mode, if I have a brain, I also can induce on that brain a cosmological constant or some four-dimensional scalar curvature. And on that brain, from the five-dimensional curvature and the gauss boundary terms, I'm going to have the Hawking-Gibbons boundary terms, which will lead me to actually four different operators of this brain bending mode pi living on the brain. And in the non-relativistic limit um, of the brain motion, or really it's more a weak field limit, I obtain actually the four Galileo invariants which were proposed by uh, Nicolas Patazzi and Giorgio in 2008. This is in a non-relativistic limit. I think most of you are familiar with this one. If I had a cosmological um, attention on the brain and I did not take the non-relativistic limit, I would have the DBI action on the brain. These are the DBI generalization to this uh, kind of term. Uh, and we can see that this leads to the four Galileo and interaction. The reason why these Galileo types of interactions have enjoyed uh, quite a, uh, a lot of success since their proposition in 2008 is because they have a lot, uh, quite a few interesting properties. Um, they're not just random interactions um, that people wrote down. First of all, they have some specific symmetry, which is realized um, after integration by parts. So it's not, it's a symmetry of the equation of motion. It's not a proper symmetry of the Lagrangian. It's a symmetry of the action um, if you have the right boundary terms, if you want. And because of that, actually, these terms satisfy a non ionization theorem because due to the symmetry, you would expect that any operator that you're going to get um, from integrations of loop is going to respect the symmetry as well, but directly at the level of the Lagrangian. And since these operators did not satisfy it at the level of the Lagrangian, you're not going to renormalize this operator per se. You're going to renormalize some other types of operators. And this is also tied to the fact that you can consider this finite number of operators as being large without being going beyond the regime of validity of your effective field theory because anything else which would be generated is going to come in with higher derivatives and therefore you can work in a regime where they are suppressed compared to these operators. And this is crucial for the vanishing mechanism to work because the vanishing mechanism is going to rely on this operator being large yet being able to trust your theory within that regime. Um, and even though they have higher derivatives, they've been constructed in such a way as such that they have no ghost. In the way they were realized from a five-dimensional Lovelock variant setup, this is kind of obvious. We didn't have any um, ghost in the 5D theory, and we don't in inherit any ghost in the four-dimensional counterpart. One of the reasons why these Galileo interactions are interesting is because they can 
they can create their own condensate and lead to the acceleration in the universe. So the, the first two here that you can barely see, uh, they can compensate each other, and that's what led to the self-accelerating solution in the DGP model. Um, this was unstable, it had a ghost. Now if you consider the other interactions which are hidden there, you can actually have some self-accelerating solution uh, so acceleration through this scalar field without any ghost, the ghost which was there in the DGP model. And yet, you, as Lam mentioned earlier, so even though they, play, they can play a role on cosmological scales, they are hidden on smaller distance scales via the Weinstein mechanism. So what is the Weinstein mechanism? Let's think of um, the force between, the gravitational force between the Earth and the Moon in this theory. So we have um, the standard gravitational force, and here is in a Galileo theory, it's not a helicity zero mode, it's just its own scalar field uh, in its own right. This is actually inherited from the massive gravity slide. Never mind, that will apply as well. Uh, if this was the end of the story, then you would think that the gravitational force between the Earth and the Moon would be mo uh, larger than just in general relativity, where you just have the one mediated by the standard um, uh, gravitational force uh, because of this extra term that comes in the two. But the Weinstein mechanism works by having all the interactions for this pi field, for, this in, for those Galileo field becoming important, and they kind of freeze the fluctuations of the field itself on top of it. So they kind of play the role of a honey on top of which the fluctuations of the field itself becomes uh, weakly coupled to anything else. So it's strongly coupled to itself, which makes it weakly coupled to the rest, um, to anything else. Uh, and even to its own self-interactions. Um, and this can happen only if the interactions for this helicity, for this uh, Galilean field happen at an energy scale which is much smaller than the Planck scale. Otherwise, you would never need to include these interactions um, before you are reaching the Schwarzschild radius, for instance. So to see that a little bit more uh, precisely for a Galilean model, let me not worry too much about what kind of interactions we, ha we have here. It could be the third Galileo or anything else. The thing is, if you have a large source, you have a large source in, in, your, in your theory, for instance, you have the Earth here, um, close to that source, the interactions will be dominate over the usual kinetic term, over the free theory here. So if I perturb my field around a large background and then fluctuations, the large background, which will be determined by the, the main source is going to dominate and it's going to redress the effective kinetic term for your fluctuations so that you actually need to canonically normalize your field. And when you do that, the effective fluctuation sees a coupling to external matter which is suppressed by this renormalization and is actually quite large. So that makes the, the effective coupling to matter being extremely small or the, the scale being much larger than the Planck scale due to the external um, background feel from the external matter present here. So this is the essence of the Manchester mechanism said uh, roughly, and that applies in a theory of massive gravity. So now let me construct different theories of uh, modified gravity, starting again from public gravity, we see that we have the Galileans, and the DGP is actually, a in some name it looks like a special case of the Galilean, where you just have the cubic interaction, or you can have a theory of hard mass gravity also arising from public uh, gravity which leads to a Galileo in some specific limit of the, of the theory. So if you want to start with 5D gravity, but yeah, we observe only four-dimensional gravity here, you need to find a way to localize gravity or to confine it or, or, or do something about it. So one way, as I mentioned before, is add a brain, and that's not enough to localize gravity. You, you really need to put some curvature on the brain. So this is the DGP model where you have an interplay between the five-dimensional part of your gravitation field and the four-dimensional part. You have two Planck scales, the five-dimensional one and the four-dimensional one. Here it is both independent. More realistically, you expect them to be of the same order of magnitude, but in the case of the DGP model, you actually take the four-dimensional Planck scale be much larger than the five-dimensional Planck scale. Um, such, in such a way that you obtain a scale out of your theory which is like this, and this scale can be actually very, very small if you take the four-dimensional Planck scale to be small. Out of this theory, from a four-dimensional point of view, you get a spectral um, representation for, the, for, for your graviton which looks like this, um, and a, with a character scale which is here, and that corresponds to a theory of soft um, massive gravity. It's not like you have one single graviton 
uh, massless graviton and then uh, some of other massive graviton, you kind of have a resonance, um, and that's what we call a soft, a zero ma soft massive gravity. An alternative to sticking uh, gravity on a brain so as to localize gravity and recover four-dimensional gravity, uh, we can do something which is more uh, common, and we can just think of a small extra dimension. So I should say in the DGP model, we can have an infinite extra dimension. The mechanism still works. If you want to avoid an infinite extra dimension, what people have been thinking more in the past, is just to have a small um, extra dimension here. I just compactified it, but it doesn't necessarily need to be the case. You can th think of all the boundary conditions. It just needs to be a finite size. And here we usually, um, thinking of doing a kaluza klein decomposition. Um, I'm not going to do a kaluza klein decomposition. I'm going to actually do a deconstruction, a discretization of the extra dimension. But at the end of the day, the two things are completely equivalent after a filler definition. And this is something which wasn't obvious necessarily in the beginning. Either for a kaluza klein decomposition or for a deconstruction, what you will get, uh, get for the spectral representation is a sum, uh, is a superposition of massive modes, a massless mode, and then some massive mode with the mass um, difference being related to the size of the extra dimension. And then if you decide to discretize your extra dimension with n points, then uh, the most massive moment would be n over, over r. So that's where your, your truncation uh, stops. In both cases, for DGP, whether you want to stick gravity on a, on a brain or whether you want to have um, a hard theory of massive gravity. So this is a hard theory of massive gravity because we really have uh, separate uh, massive gravitons, you end up um, knowing that you start from a five-dimensional theory of gravity, which only had for, for a massless theory of um, a massless spin to field in five dimensions, having five degrees of freedom, starting from that theory kind of ensures, if you know what you're doing, that you only end up with five degrees of freedom in from your four-dimensional point of view, and so five degrees of freedom for your massive spin to field in four dimensions, which is the right degrees of freedom to avoid the normal ball wide as a ghost instability. So this is kind of a, a mechanism that allows you to make sure you're not ha doing anything wrong. There, there's some, you really need to, <laughs> it's easy for me to say now that I know the answer, that uh, ha how to, to get it. People have tried that uh, in uh, 10 years ago, um, doing a deconstruction, to get a theory of massive gravity, and they were obtaining a ghost uh, due to some other reasons. But I'll show what it is you have to do to avoid these ghost-like instabilities. In both cases, as I mentioned before, being DGP or being hard mass gravity, you end up in some limit uh, with a scalar a theory of gravity with a scalar degree of freedom, which uh, looks like a Galilean scalar field. I should, I should say, it's not because in some limit it looks like gravity with a scalar field that it is just a theory of uh, gravity with a scalar field. In massive gravity the, gravity, the gravity part is really different. The graviton really does have a mass, and that will mean that the gravitational force will have a finite range. It's not just a theory of GR plus a scalar field. You do modify your, uh, your theory of gravity. And uh, because they behave as a, well, we can see that they are, have a vaginal mechanism as they look like a Galilean, uh, the scalar part or the helicity zero mode of the graviton behaves as a Galilean scalar degree of freedom in some limit. And that's the easiest way to see how the Weinstein mechanism gets um, implemented in this case. So let me go a little bit through the deconstruction of 5D gravity to obtain a theory of 4D ma massive gravity because it's, um, it's something which wasn't completely obvious from the beginning and actually led to a few misconceptions. So this idea is not new, it's uh, 10 years old, and actually it's much older than that. People try to do that for gauge theories, et cetera. Um, it didn't work originally. Um, it, if you start with your theory of 5D gravity and you start to discretize, people were recovering the Bolwa desert ghost, but actually it's been pointed out by these um, very nice uh, papers here that really in, in such theories, the fundamental objects you, you should work with is the field bound field. And most of the time, it doesn't really matter whether you want to work with the metric or whether, whether you want to work with the field bind. But if you want uh, ultimately to couple your theory with fermions, then the field binds are the guys. So it's, it's always better to start with the field bind. If you can go back to your metric language afterwards, that's okay. If you can, then that's, uh, that's too bad. Um, so let me start with the field bind. And we'll discretize the field bound. So starting from a continuous theory, what I can do is at every point, instead of saying that they are a function of y, I just say they are the nth uh, part of my, of my field, and I'll do that for the, for the field bind. 
this is all fine. If we, are, if we start with a theory of 5D uh, general relativity, then we're going to have y derivatives along, derivatives along the extra dimension. So I need to define what I mean by that. Um, so this is the extrinsic curvature, which corresponds to the derivative of the metric, which I want to write as a derivative of the field line. And that's where my discretization procedure comes in. Um, instead of having a e at a given y, I split them into e n. And instead of having a y derivative, um, a derivative along the history dimension, I substitute this by its discrete counterpart. So that's what gives you the relation between what's going on at one place, at one site, with what's going on at the next site. I decide to write the derivative like this. Uh, you can have a two or three sites derivative um, that really doesn't change anything at all. And also, at this level, I decide to de define what uh, the field bind is as being what it is at once. But I could decide to be it the, the average between two points or something different. That, that's actually interesting as I'm going to generalize the theory of massive gravity. But at this level, it doesn't change at all. So, all you need to do is this really basic discretization procedure. That's really nothing um, difficult at all. You plug that back in. And so what you get for your extrinsic curvature, so for the derivative of the metric along the extra dimension, is some difference between field binds, which written back in terms of the metric, you obtain a square root structure which corresponds to um, the interplay between the metric at one point and the metric at another point. And for those of you who seen a, bit, a little bit of massive gravity before, you recognize the square root structure that you need to have in massive gravity to avoid the Bollard desert ghost. But from here, that's just inherited automatically from the five from the direction. So now to construct your theory of massive gravity, it's really simple. You have your extrinsic curvature of k, and you replace it by an over k, and you're done. So that's your theory of massive gravity in four dimension. Actually, it's not really a theory of massive gravity in this case. All the metrics at every site is dynamical. So you have a theory of n interacting um, gravitons. One of them is massless, and the other one are massive. To see the mass spectrum, you would need to do a Fourier decomposition of that. And that's where that corresponds exactly to what you would have had in a kaluza klein decomposition after you do your full transform and after you feel the definition. So this is just to motivate how you get, obtain a theory of four, um, 4D massive gravity out of a theory of 5D <coughs> massive gravity. You can also do a decoupling limit of that. You're not necessarily required to think of the dynamics at every point. You can just look at the interplay between them and, and, and freeze some of the kinetics, and then you will obtain uh, some theory of um, massive graviton without uh, multiple um, uh, gravitons. What you can see then, and what you know already from a theory of massive gravity, is that, well, first of all, you can truncate the theory here. You, you, just, you just consider n sites. So you have a, the most massive mode is at n over r. That's the mass of your most massive mode. And you just truncated your theory there. And there's absolutely no ghost. So this is a completely consistent truncation of your five-dimensional theory. That's completely consistent with no ghost. What you do have, on the other hand, is a strong coupling scale, which is related to the mass of the lowest uh, kaluza klein mode, or the lowest uh, mode in your discretization. And so that tells you that your theory is strongly coupled at that scale. And now when you try to send m to 0, or the size of the extra dimension to infinity, what you don't recover five-dimensional gravity because your theory becomes stronger and strongly coupled. The Weinstein mechanism works more and more. You're freezing your three extra degrees of freedom that you have per sites, and actually you don't recover your 5D continuous theory of uh, 5D gravity with five degrees of freedom continuously. You really recover f uh, th multiple theories of gravity which are just not interacting. And this is what you wanted to have in the first place. So there's kind of a trade-off of whether you want to be able to have a truncated theory of um, interacting gravitons from a four-dimensional point of view, where you want to be able to trust your theory all the way up to that scale there, in which case you need to do the discretization in the way I've set it up, where actually you need to set some gauge before you do your discretization. And, this, and the gauge we set here is setting the five-dimensional lapse to one. Or you don't do that. If you don't do that, then the game is completely different. You don't obtain this strong coupling scale, but also you obtain some degrees of freedom which are there related to the lapse degree of freedom, which tells you that you cannot truncate the theory at that scale because you keep a ghost at that scale. And that ghost only disappears when you, thank you, when you send um, this scale to infinity when you recover the continuous limit. So either you want to be able to have a truncated theory, where, and then you will get 
Uh, if you really will get your truncated theory with a strong coupling scale and you're not going to recover five dimensional gravity, or you do your discretization in such a way that you never going to look at a truncated theory and you'll be able to recover your 5D theory. Okay, so let me go a little bit quicker through the next point and just uh, tell you how this theory is actually stable to some extent from my quantum point of view. The absence of Bollwood as a ghost, the absence of six degree of freedom is tightly related to this specific structure of the potential. And the, this uh, one way to see how this uh, is a nice structure is once you get... Um, you, you, you should see the Galileo appearing as the helicity zero mode, which appears after Schuckerberization. If you don't know this word, just have a look at the um, Oxford Dictionary of English Language, and that means uh, Jimmy New goes to this thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, you might be used to this. This is what you do, and that's what Schuckerberg did uh, when he wanted to include this for the, uh, for the photon. Prokaf field. Now, being GR, you have to do some nonlinearities. You need to include this thing here. And because it is quadratic here, this is related to the fact that you need to have a square root coming in here. This special structure removes all the high derivative terms in, uh, in uh, pi, and what you obtain is a Galileon for the field pi uh, in here. Now, this special structure, uh, you expect it to be uh, destabilized by quantum corrections. If I look at just a one loop to the two-point function, it won't preserve the nice fields poly structure that you have here, and that will tell you that you would expect to recover a ghost by quantum corrections if you just look at that diagram that will come in at the Planck scale. So from here, you just expect the mass of the ghost to be the Planck scale. That's not something you should worry too much about. But if I think of a higher endpoint function, then I will have something which looked like this. And if I put myself on, 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 a, big, on a big background, and then this N operator, this uh, I/O operator, can look like a ghost with some of these uh, arising from the background structure. And I would say that the Weinstein mechanism relies on this thing being extremely large. So that will tell you that this is small. So if you are on top of a large background configuration for your field, you expect by quantum corrections to generate something which would lead to a mass of the ghost, which should be much smaller than the Planck scale. And actually, this you can find easily backgrounds for which this will be smaller than the scale lambda. And so you recover the ghost within the regime where you would like to trust your theory. And so you just rolled out. Well, that's not the end of the story. Actually, the way this happens, if you're thinking of um, a large configuration for your, for your field, you need to do that not only at that level, but you need to see how that redresses also the, the two-point function and it redresses the whole one-loop effective action. So if you do it consistently at the level of a one-loop effective action, this is something we've done with Raquel Ribeiro, who's maybe here somewhere, and Lavinia Heisenberg, you see that not only it redresses what you expect here, the, your mass matrix, it also redresses your whole um, uh, propagator in such a way that when you're considering large, con large configuration for your background, this thing never becomes uh, much larger than one. And so uh, even if you're on top of a large background configuration, the mass of the ghost is never going to become smaller than the Planck scale, even if you're on top of that. And that seems to work out nicely. So it's really telling you how the Weinstein mechanism is also working at the quantum level. This is at the level of the one loop effective action, but we expect the same thing to happen even better at, uh, at higher loops. So now let me finish in the last 10 minutes by um, some potential issues that arise in, or less, um, in uh, Galilean models. And this is going to happen typically in theories of massive gravity as well and happens in DGP as well. So let me go back to... Uh, the, the simplest Galilean model, which is just the cubic Galilean, just because it's simpler, but the same thing happens for all the, the Galileans. And once again, let me split this field into a background configuration, which I'm going to consider to be large, so this thing is large, and some fluctuation, which I call pi again. And what happens is that I redresses the kinetic terms like this, um, and that, that affects uh, the theory in two, very poten in two potentially very bad ways. First of all, we see that the effective metric that the fluctuation sees uh, has changed. So it has changed the kinetic structure, and that tells you that it might potentially change the causal structure of your field. So if you have two different fields, the standard model fields and the Galilean field, which sees two different effective metrics, then you can have some 
uh, which don't have the same causal structure, then one field can propagate superluminally with respect to the other one. And that has been pointed out in the case of massive gravity by Beza and Waldron um, this year. And based on this result, people have then used the causality, went back in time, and wrote some papers um, since this year. Uh, they are showing that the same thing happened uh, in a Galileo theory. So this is definitely some, some trouble um, that happened in the theory of massive, uh, massive gravity and a Galileo thank you, uh, theory uh, in general. Now something else which is tightly related to the Vanshaw mechanism per se is the strong coupling, which is needed for the Vanshaw mechanism to happen, but also once you hit the scale lambda, you wonder whether you can tr trust the theory at all um, or not. So on top of our background configuration, you have to redress your, your field. You can only normalize it as I did before. And so the redress scale at which the interactions occur is not the lambda, but lambda over square root z. And in the case of the Earth, so if I take, uh, here I'm thinking of a, a massive gravity theory. So if I, if I take the mass of the graviton to be of the Hubble parameter size, and I take the mass uh, to be that of the Earth, and I put in myself at the surface of the Earth, this redress scale is typically of the order of the centimeter. Once you hit that scale, then all hell breaks loose. You don't know what's going on. You don't know if you can trust your theory. So that's, a, that's actually a very low energy scale to already hit, be hit by quantum corrections. So what do you do after that? Do you just throw away the theory, or do you try to resum these uh, loops in such a way that you can go beyond that? And actually, this is what you can do, um, and you use the duality Galileon mentioned by Andrew uh, yesterday. So for those of you who were at Andrew's talk yesterday, uh, you might know what I'm talking about. For those of you who don't, then just use the superluminality, go back in time and see his talk. Um, so, so both the strong coupling issues and the superluminalities plague a priori a Galilean theory and to some extent massive gravity. Uh, there's a, just a question mark here, not for the strong coupling, but for the superluminalities. It's been shown that some solution of massive gravity has superluminalities. Uh, it's not clear to which extent stable solutions of massive gravity, which are consistent, have superluminalities, but that's just a, a, a small uh, effect. Um, but actually, it's been shown uh, and Andrew mentioned that in his talk yesterday, that Galilean theories can be shown to be dual, and in some cases, the dual theory is a completely free theory. A completely free theory, which by definition has no strong coupling issues, it's just free, and has no superluminalities. It, it doesn't have any interactions, it doesn't have anything. So how could that be? Uh, let me show how that duality works, not in the case Andrew mentioned yesterday, but in a slightly different setup, but because there's different ways you can think of this duality, and for more precision, I really encourage you to look at these talks because I only have about one minute and a half to talk about that, and it's a little bit technical. Let me consider a static uh, configuration for our Galileon just because it's simpler, and I'll focus again on the cubic Galileon. With this cubic Galileon, I can do a very non-trivial, and it's not non-local, I wouldn't say it's local, but it's not non-local in the usual sense, a field redefinition where I change not only uh, my field, but also change my coordinates. This is something very non-trivial, and that doesn't arise out of the blue. It's actually been shown by these people to be a Lejeune transform, um, and it's actually what comes in in a theory by gravity. That's one of the ways you can see that there's a duality between these two fields. Anyways, you do this field a coordinate transformation, and what you get out of it, well, it's a cubic Galileo. So <laughs> you might not have one much. Actually, you do. You do have one a lot because the relation between the coordinates here and the relation between the coordinates there, and also the relation between, uh, if I had put a scale here, g, what I would have obtained uh, in this case is the inverse g here. You can't see quite it here because I rescaled things, but actually when you are dominated by that interaction in the original theory, that corresponds to be dominated by this interaction in that theory. So there's a strong weak coupling duality in this, uh, in this duality. Uh, one very easy way to see that here is that um, the coordinate gets transformed uh, like this. So if you're in the very strong, thank you, strong coupling region in the original theory, x is very small, that corresponds to becoming, to go at x is infinity for the dual theory, where the theory is very weakly coupled. You expect to recover your, your standard free theory, uh, as I mentioned here. So there's a duality between when these interactions dominate in the original theory and when that interaction dominates in the, in the 
dual theory, and that's your strong weak coupling uh, theory. So that allows you actually to resum uh, when the theory is strongly coupled here and you have a lot of an infinite number of loops to resum in here, that allows you this field of ruination to repackage them and you know exactly what you end up here with your dual theory. So in particular, if you start with your dual theory, uh, you know that your theory will be um, in the weak, in the weak uh, coupling region, in the region where this term dominates, your theory will be under control so long as um, you don't consider distances larger than the scale lambda minus one. But now if you read that back in terms, so you do all your calculation in there, you do all your observable, observables in this, uh, in this regime, and now you repackage that back into your original theory, what dx is in terms of your original dx tilde is the, that multiplied by an extra factor here which depends on how you were sourced in the first place. You put all of that together, what that corresponds to for your final theory is that your final, th what you had done here is in control, so you are within the regime of control of your, validity of your dual theory, if you're looking at distances which are larger than 10 to the minus eight centimeters, if you put everything, thank you for, for the Earth. So that shows you how you have actually, by doing things, doing computation in the dual theory, which resums everything out for you, you can go much beyond the scale lambda, which you already have originally thought that was uh, the end of all your theory. So that what allow you to go uh, much beyond your strong coupling scale lambda. So let me just finish by saying that, well, we have an exciting theory that allows you to do lots of things, uh, in particular, maybe potentially time acceleration and um, maybe sometime we could say something about the cosmological constant problem. Um, we know how to construct a theory of massive gravity and we actually know how it can't arises from a theory of 5D gravity. It's actually just a deconstruction which is completely equivalent to a Kaliza Klein decomposition. I should also mention that um, originally people thought that if you st started by 5D gravity and you did a Kaliza Klein decomposition, you, would, you wouldn't get any of these strong coupling issues. You wouldn't get these kind of theories of massive gravity. Everything would be sorted out uh, for yourself, but no one really worked that out in, in detail. And when you do this for a Kaliza Klein decomposition and you fix the laps, what you obtain is exactly this theory of goes through massive gravity with all the non-coupling, uh, the, all the, the, the coupling, the strong coupling issues that uh, we end up with. It behaves as a Galilean theory, which uh, in some limit, which potentially has supernatis and strong uh, coupling issues, uh, but they are potentially resolved by the dual Galileo. Um, and the supernatis, I'm not, I haven't gone through in too much detail, but I'm happy to answer questions about that. And also, to see how crazy we are on the, on the Napoleon scale. I'll just finish with that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cla uh, Claudia. Um, other questions? Um, well, thank you for your talk. Um, I have just a, a, a comment about one of your first slides, and uh, you had you had it, it just. Be, I'm saying it because it start confusing some uh, youngsters and some people in the field. You put dark energy, and then underneath it you put uh, you put um, you, you put uh, modification to gravity, and you put uh, if we can look. Yes, so you put uh, new degrees of freedom in the matter sector and new de degrees of freedom in the gravity sector. So I think this is creating some confusion because I think the, 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 uh, I think the, the way we have been doing this is that we have cosmic acceleration and then from cosmic acceleration that you can have, under that one you have new degrees of freedom in the matter sector and new degrees of freedom in the gravity sector. In which, in which case dark energy is not the englobing, englobing idea, but it's rather one of the items. In, yeah. fact, in your, yeah. it should go under. Uh, how about I write it dark field. and then dark energy in dark gravity? Would it be happier? Yeah, because, but yeah, but I think I think normally to follow the hierarchy, it starts confusing some people about what dark energy is and cosmic. But it's good. It's confusing because sometimes it's not one or the other. It's it's in between, or you, you, you can choose. For, for, 
for Faber R, it's not really that it is a modification of gravity. It's, it's really a new degree of freedom. So sometimes you might have thought it was a modification of gravity, but really it was just dark energy. So I, I completely appreciate and, 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 and understand what you mean. It's okay. It, we can debate that later. Next um, so the, the idea that the Galileans might be UV complete, I think, is, is super exciting. But um, I'm, I, I wanted to ask how sure you are that that also applies for, for massive gravity, because I'm worried about the, the couplings to matter and, and whether, whether problems come in when you couple the theory to matter. Oh, so, so the coupling to matter in, um, is the same for a Galilean and, and almost the same for, for massive gravity. You have this extra, this formal uh, coupling in uh, massive gravity. But that we, we, you would know through the duality how to go from one Earth to the other. So it's not that it's going to work for Galileo and it's going to not work for massive gravity. If anything, it's, you would expect it to work better for massive gravity because that's where it arises from in the first place. So this, the, the, this duality arose from a theory by gravity where you can, you can couple to matter as well and you can introduce the sugar bulk uh, in, in one, one language or another language. Uh, and they are completely equivalent because it was your choice to decide who was the real reference metric. So th the duality is not going to be broken by adding uh, a coupling to matter in, uh, in massive gravity. Um, but okay. it's going to tell you how you have to, to include it. So the, the, the reason that I, I'm worried is I think if I have the disformal coupling, I can compute a one loop correction to two to two particle scattering that is divergent in the UV. And I don't see how. Yeah, so, so I think that probably the, the disformal coupling is, is what you have in, in, in some limit, but it, in massive gravity, it's not like it's just that. It, you, you got it from uh, putting some stuff in your H menu. And so just don't do that in the first place if you want. And that's really the original way you introduce your sugar ball fields and you, you, your original way you should see the, the duality. Uh, only after that you do your field redefinition. So, uh, and I, I don't know exactly how that will work out once you do your, your diagonalization. But the, the natural realization is, is when you're not diagonalized, when, when you're not diagonalized with the, between the helicity two and the helicity zero. So I'm, I'm, I, I don't think this is gonna change the, the structure. Uh, in any ways you know that the, the coupling to matter is with when, I haven't written a theory by gravity here, but it, your coupling to matter is either respect to one metric or to the other, uh, and you do it like that. And I'm like, okay, one, one thing I should say though, uh, that reminds me, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, let, let me just take this opportunity to say something else. Um, we know actually, um, th there's also always the question of why um, when you couple to matter, you are only couple to one specific metric rather than two metrics at the same time or something like that. Here is going natural. You start with your family theory of gravity uh, and you add whatever m coupling you have. At, that, at one given point, you also have one given whatever scalar field uh, chi n and, and that chi n coupled to that metric g mu n uh, in a specific way, uh, in, a, in a covariant way. Yeah, if it were covariant. Then you can have some interactions between the species at this side and the species at that other side, uh, which are very like these kind of interactions, but you don't have that the kinetic structure, four dimensional kinetic structure of the species on that side coupled with another metric, uh, for instance. Yeah. But, but the duality really arose from, um, the, it's your choice to decide in a biogravity theory how you're gonna stuckerborize it. And the, the, the matter Lagrangian, before, you don't do the stochopolization in matter Lagrangian to start with. Only after diagonalization, you start seeing some interactions. Yeah. Okay. I think we should close there for coffee. So let's thank Claudia again. Thank you.
a problem here. But don't go, we'll be with you in a minute. Okay, before we start the next session, we have a couple of uh, announcements. Okay, ah, yes, the first was this. Aha, I, it's always dangerous to switch over. But all these, um, all, all the, uh, the lectures are now uh, classified on, on this uh, website here. In fact, we're going to have uh, links on the program page to each of these uh, each of the lectures themselves. So there's a, a nice high quality webcast available. And uh, uh, there have been a lot of comments about how well the webcast has gone. So, so do tell your friends about it and have a, have a look at uh, any lecture that you missed. And, um, and that brings us to the, to the thanks because uh, you know, so, some people, uh, some of our sessions have, have had um, 3,000 viewers. Can you believe that? That's the science sessions. Yeah, I don't believe it either. But anyway, <laughs> numbers say. But anyway, we, we greatly appreciate uh, Barney Baggs, Steve Eisen, and Julian King for doing such a wonderful job uh, from the university service here. So if we could thank them first. So, right. but but. Uh, to thank those who've done so much work. To, to make this uh, meeting such a success. And, uh, you know, everything in the UK is done sort of Heathrow style, that is on a shoestring, and it only works because of the dedication of individuals. So James Park and, uh, is, has been working full-time on this, and Sue Gadsby has uh, used to do James's job and came back part-time especially for this. And we appreciate their unstinting efforts uh, on our behalf. And so we've got some small tokens, so if they could come forward and uh, we can express our appreciation for all their hard work on our behalf. So thanks very much. That's for James. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, in terms of technical support on Cali, uh, but instead of that, he's done a tremendous amount uh, on our websites and and all the other technical issues associated with this. So, we'd like to thank him as well. So, Andre, thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. Good yeah. 
<laughs> At this stage, the uh, funding ran out for, uh, for tokens, but Know, putting these uh, the central core in the in, a, in order for our, our dinners and and so forth. So we appreciate Mick Young. They may be watching. And as I said, you know, it was uh, all done on a shoestring. So we really depended on our forced laborers. I mean, our volunteers, students here, some of whom have their names misspelt. Okay, so these. <laughs> These are really good, good guys. So remember those names. Good citizens, and uh, let's uh, them for well. Now, rarely does a local organising committee thank, but we're pretty pleased with the results today. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I just want to embarrass Daniel actually by uh, pointing out, uh, you know, he and he's. Arranging subs, getting all the uh, parallel sessions, and I really think the high quality of this meeting has depended on his uh, unstinting efforts. So I think we should thank Daniel for doing an excellent job. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, now we have a further announcement from the Cosmo representative at this meeting. likes to have a sort of Oscar speech and the music would have been going on and he'd have been off or something. So uh, I'm going to be very quick and tell you about the next Cosmo. For that, again, thanks. You've seen Paul and Anne and Daniel, but just thanks to the team here at Cambridge for running a great meeting. And the next Cosmo is going to be in Chicago. I believe those are the dates, but please check for confirmation. And so, see you next year in the Windy City. Thank you. And now, uh, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Richard Easter, who's not going to talk about dark energy, he tells me, but on inflation. Hang on a minute, my um, my thing and my setup has all. Uh, oh, you, deleted my, you deleted my talk, guys. Come on. I we screwed it up. And you screwed up my thing so that I don't have. <laughs> I had I originally had my screen set so that you could see. You have, you have to edit this out of the um, of the webcast, but I had my I had my screen set so that you could see everything from the um, so that I could see one screen and you could see another screen, and I would like to get that back. So if you give me a second. Hang on a minute. Mirror display is off. Let's see what that does. Let's go to my talk. Can you see my talk? Hopefully not. Um, that is my talk. Cause my Easter. It looks good. Here we go. Okay. okay now I think you. we're all set. Okay. So um, firstly, I'd just like to to, um, to reaffirm the comments that were made previously. Speaking as as I think um, someone who's come a long way to attend this meeting, um, it's been completely worth it. And so I'd again like to thank the um, the Cambridge organisers um, both for inviting me and also for, for organizing a, a really fantastic discussion of the current uh, status of uh, our thinking about the universe. Uh, the second thing I need to do is to, um, apparently, I, I thought coming to Cambridge, I thought putting a little French tag in my, in my title um, would, would, be, um, would, you know, would be transparent to all involved, but a number of people have asked me what my, um, what my talk is about, uh, or what my slide is about. And so, um, so despite the fact that, um, that I assumed that this would be okay, I, I will begin by um, providing a, a, a quick lesson. It's, a, um, it's apparently a, a shortening of a phrase in French uh, that translates as the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I guess there has been a sense that our understanding of inflation hasn't changed dramatically in the wake of Planck. And there was this hope that, that Planck would see a dramatic change in our, our grip on the early universe. I won't try and pronounce it because I, I attended a school in New Zealand that was modelled on a very traditional British style of school, little hats and blazers and caning, um, and they imported, um, they imported teachers from England because those were the best, where the best teachers came from. And the man who taught me French had been in the British Army and he was fond of addressing boys as if they were on a parade ground. 
And um, we couldn't understand him when he spoke English because he spoke with this very thick upper class English accent. And we couldn't tell a difference when he spoke French. So, um, <laughs> so, so he's very much of the, if you say it loud, the foreigners will understand school of um, French pronunciation. So I can read French, but I unfortunately will not try to speak it in the um, company of people who grew up on the continent of Europe. Um, so that ends that part of my talk. Um, <laughs> So now I want to just, um, you know, this, this needs no, um, no, the Planck satellite needs no introduction. And I guess the other thing to say is to salute the people who worked on this. I, 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 this is the second swami part of my talk. But I mean, it really is one of the most profound achievements of modern science to have measured the, you know, the, this light that has, has um, you know, been traveling to us for you know, 13.8 minus 380,000, 13.8 billion years minus 380,000. And to have extracted, you know, 2,000 numbers that tell us something about the global properties of the universe from the, um, from the multiple expansion is, is, really, is really quite remarkable. And it's been fantastic as a theorist who's you know, closely associated with, with the analysis of this data or the understanding of what this data can do, but not involved with the um, experiment itself. It's really been a fascinating process to watch. On the other hand, I, th I think what that's actually done for the theoretical community is we've been looking forward to this for so long. We kind of believed that somehow we would wake up the day after the Planck satellite announced its results and would go outside and the sky would be a different color, you know, that the world would change completely. But it turns out that the only thing that changed the color of the sky was that Planck people chose a different color map for their, um, for, no, for their CMV map relative to the W map one. But our, our immediate understanding of the universe didn't um, change um, profoundly. And I actually, um, just out of curiosity, I, I looked up the number of papers on spires they used the phrase Planck mission, Planck spacecraft, or Planck satellite somewhere in the, um, in the opening of the paper. And you can see that people have been writing papers about this at a pretty steady rate um, since the beginning, of the, um, the beginning of the 21st century. And it's, you know, it kicks up a little bit with the launch. You see the spike with the um, data release in March. And then you see um, the, you know, that things have continued. So we have been anticipating this day for a very, very long time. And we have, I think, theorists kind of risk feeling as if they're children that have gone and unwrapped all of their presents, you know, um, holiday presents, and they've they found, you know, not exactly the thing that they were hoping to find, you know. There is no non-Gaussianity at the moment. We haven't found features. We haven't found, you know, some radical extension of the Lambda CDM paradigm um, that we've grown used to. So I think um, it's actually worth reminding ourselves exactly what it is that we have as cosmologists, and let's quickly review what it was that we already knew. What? That's well, I'm, I'll, yeah, I'll take it any time you want. My birthday is in November. So, <laughs> um, so I think the, the one of the key things is that the Lambda CDM cosmology, we heard a lot at the beginning of the conference about um, the experiments that have been done at the LHC. And you know, again, the same story is told there. The, the discovery at the Higgs was a discovery, but in some sense it was confirmatory rather than a revolution in our understanding of particle physics. It would have been a bigger surprise if we'd found you know, evidence, for, you know, strong evidence for physics beyond the standard model, or if no, no Higgs had um, shown up at the LHC at all. And, and it's in some sense, I think, that we're in the same position with regard to Lambda CDM cosmology. Uh, one of the things I would want to say about Lambda CDM was to remind us is that there is very strong evidence for beyond the standard model physics in the way that we look at the universe. So, you know, people at the LHC say we haven't seen anything beyond the standard model. It turns out people who do cosmology have seen things beyond the standard model for many years. And so let's just remind us what, the num what these numbers mean. So we know we have Hubble's constant. And this is a number that we're never going to be able to determine kind of a priori because it's simply a number that tells us when we happen to look at the particular scenario that we're looking at. So this tells us that the fundamental parameters in the model are a function of time. And when we choose to carry out the observation, whether it's at 13.8 or 14.8 billion years, is going to change the, um, the values of the parameters that we measure. Um, on the other hand, there are three parameters that, um, you know, that are only two of them if we, if we have a, a prior that the model is flat, but the baryon fraction, the cosmological constant, and the amount of dark matter in the universe. All of those things relate to physics that are, that are outside of the standard model and are presumably telling us something about particle physics. The problem is, is we don't necessarily know what, um, what that something is. Looking at inflation, um, we measured the, um, you know, the primordial power spectrum in terms of the amplitude and in terms of the spectral index. And it's worth stressing that these aren't fundamental parameters. These, aren't para these are purely empirical parameters that relate to some you know, convenient characterization of the power spectrum. They're not numbers that show up directly in, in gut scale or stringy physics. They're simply um, convenient ways of um, characterizing an unknown function. But they're related somehow to um, physics at the gut or the string scale, potentially. And finally, we have the reionization um, physics. And those, in principle, is, you know, in many cases, I think the reionization physics is something we could um, compute a priori if we are only smart enough. 
It doesn't necessarily relate to new physics, but it does relate to physics that we can't easily, um, easily quantify. So the glass half full approach to this would be to say that Planck has confirmed our, our fundamental understanding of the universe. And this should be good news. You know, this is the way that science is supposed to work. You know, we have this deep understanding of the universe. It's, it's surprising in many ways in terms of the, um, the dark sector. But it's telling us that, in fact, despite this surprising and apparently counterintuitive version of the universe that we've come to have, um, that we can you know, greatly increase our ability to measure the universe without necessarily um, seeing that we have to add any new parameters. So it tells us that the model we had actually has a surprising amount of, um, uh, of uh, explanatory power. You know, we had a model, it survived, and the parameter volume um, you know, contracted. So in some sense, this is a successful prediction. The problem is, is that doesn't tell us as cosmologists what it is that, um, that we need to do next. The glass half empty version of the story is that there were many things that we were hoping to see and we got nothing. So we didn't see any non-Gaussianity, we haven't seen any evidence for tensors, and we haven't seen any new evidence for, um, for features, either in terms of large-scale anisotropies on the sky or in terms of uh, features in the, in the power spectrum of the um, CMB. Um, there's also the questions around late-time physics, whether it's neutrinos or non-standard dark matter. Um, I'm going to focus uh, more closely on the early universe here. So I think one of the things that's worth doing is actually, I mean, it's, it's more than 30 years ago that inflation was described in detail. And so I think it's worth um, pausing and reflecting what is it that we should expect um, from an inflationary model. And the first question is to ask a really deep question, you know, what is inflation itself? And so the standard textbook description is to say that inflation is accelerated expansion. It's a phase in the early universe during which the, the, the second derivative of the um, scale factor in Einstein gravity is positive. But you could be a little bit more subtle in this distinction, and you, in this definition, and you could say that, in fact, what inflation is, is it's a period during which the co-moving horizon size is contracting. And so that is what you need, in fact, to set up the, um, the, the apparently a-causal um, you know, structure that we see in the present universe, where patches of the universe that apparently haven't been able to communicate with each other uh, um, you know, were in causal contact at some point in the past. So you can take some region that's well correlated, you cause the, um, the, the co-moving horizon to contract, and then you have uh, the universe that, we, that we're living in. And that can, in fact, be achieved in other ways. It can be achieved uh, through egg pyrosis, or so, you know, these uh, brain world models. It can also be achieved, if you want, um, by having a very large speed of light in the primordial universe, which then allows you to correlate things in a causal fashion, but on scales that are much larger than, than the one we currently live in. So if you, if you adopted that definition of inflation, and to some extent it's a historical accident that our first working model of inflation was also one that, um, that had directly accelerated expansion, then you would have a somewhat different view of inflation. And particularly, I think, if you, if you really, if, if you know, things had worked differently, the thing that we would have seen as being the fundamental um, prediction of inflation is that the perturbations that seed the formation of large-scale structure in the universe existed at recombination. So this isn't a particularly new result, and, but what it does is it tells you that if the perturbations are there when the universe is ionized, you're going to have a different um, uh, polarization because the, the, the way that the, no, the um, electrons will scatter, um, you know, if the perturbations are there for the producer potential wells that they're moving inside of at recombination, will be different if, um, relative to, the, to a universe in which the perturbations were laid down when the universe was, um, was, was electrically neutral. And so this correlation was observed by WMAP um, you know, in the early um, part of the century, and as far as I know, it was actually first worked out by um, Spergel and Zaldariaga in, in 1997. I asked Dave um, for the reference on this. Um, Matthias may want to, uh, is there any prior art on this? You, you don't think so? So you know, if, if inflation had been invented by people who are astrophysicists, whose primary job was to think about the CMB, it's, it's highly likely that this correlation would have been worked out in the 80s and it would have been presented to us as the key prediction of inflation. This would have been the smoking gun of a universe in which the co-moving horizon size was decreasing as a function of time. So we've observed this by W, you know, WMAP observed this, but the thing that we've been waiting for is the observation of tensor modes, which is often presented to us as, in terms of, you know, as being the canonical thing that inflation gives you, because the models of inflation that people were primarily used to in the 1980s were models of inflation that have large values of the scalar field, large energy, and therefore naturally produce a, a, you know, a substantial tensor, tensor contribution to the um, uh, pr primordial uh, perturbation spectrum. So that's as a matter of you know, kind of historical curiosity in some sense. But it, you know, the, and the key thing to remember is that inflation has already made um, very, very non-trivial predictions that have been verified um, with, with an enormous amount of confidence by existing microwave background measurements. And, and I'm sure will be uh, further confirmed by Planck when its um, polarization maps become available. 
Um, so the next thing that people have talked about a lot is, uh, um, is the non-Gaussianity. And so again, it's worth reflecting on what is actually natural for the, no, uh, what is our natural expectation for the non-Gaussianity in the context of inflation. And to some extent, I think a large FNL is some, in some sense a streetlight because we've all looked under it, but our keys may well be somewhere else. In some sense, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's analogous to supersymmetry in the context of the standard model. Thousands and thousands of papers have been written on supersymmetry, but there's no compulsion for the universe to either be supersymmetric or to be supersymmetric in a way that, um, that we can hope to measure at the LHC. So you know, all of the different models of inflation that people have proposed, it's very natural to see something that, um, that gives you an approximately Harrison's elbow bridge spectrum. But on the other hand, we see that the value of the non-Gaussianity that you compute in the standard FNL parameter covers many, many orders of magnitude. So clearly this is a quantity that has huge discriminatory power because you have a you know, quantity that can vary by at least a range of 100 uh, relative to, to NS, which, you know, NS minus 1, which varies by just you know, a factor of a few between models. Um, and so, so it's clear that the non-Gaussianity is going to be very good at choosing between models. On the other hand, uh, and I, you know, again, I want to um, salute the people who have um, performed this analysis because you know, the ability to constrain multiple um, version, you know, multiple different styles of non-Gaussianity in a single um, calculation is something that has rendered what would otherwise be a completely intractable analysis tractable. So it's a, it's a beautiful piece of work that's gone into the, um, into the Planck analysis. And so the, the problem is, from the point of view of providing surprises, if you look at simple inflationary models, they tend to predict that the amount of primordial non-Gaussianity you expect to see is proportional to the first slow roll parameter, epsilon. And that, by definition, is a quantity that's much less than one. Interactions in the early universe will typically give you FNL of order one, even if it's not primordial. And as a matter of um, cosmic variance, a value of FNL of, you know, on the order of one or order of a few is the limit for a measurement that's based on a CMB. So any, um, you know, from this perspective, any measurement of a primordial non-Gaussianity would have involved a model that was in some way non-minimal. So I don't think it should come as a huge surprise to us that, um, you know, that, that, that Planck has returned a null result for a um, pr primordial non-Gaussianity. There was no particular reason to expect that it would, um, you know, that FNL was going to be 10 or some greater number for some, for some easily observable triangle. Um, on the other hand, FNL um, tells us how it was that the universe went about shrinking the co-moving horizon because the interactions between modes depend much more sensitively on the inflationary mechanism itself than the, um, than the production, the, uh, than the mechanism that produces the, um, the modes in the first place. So non-Gaussianity is a null result. Um, it tells us that inflation is in some sense closer to a minimal scenario than we might um, previously have thought or hoped. Um, so the next thing to look at is the perturbations. And I think this is now a pretty familiar plot for people who are working in this area. It's one that um, you know, versions of it were produced by WMAP. And now we're seeing um, you know, the, the, this is the version from the, from, from the Planck paper. And so the standard thing to do is to take, um, you know, to take the predictions of different inflationary models and lay them down on this, um, on this, on, on this uh, plane in, um, relative to the, tensor, to, to the tensor amplitude and to the um, primordial tilt. And so this is an, this, no, this, um, this, no, the volume allowed in here has shrunk substantially, but it hasn't yet shrunk to the point where you're going to be able to rule out a large number of inflationary models that were viable um, when you only looked at, um, at the WMAP9 the WMAP data. Um, a key thing that comes out of this is a question of whether or not a simple model of inflation is also in some sense unnatural when you look at it from the perspective of particle theory. And so Cliff Burgess said exactly the same thing um, in his talk earlier this week. And so one of the things that I um, took away from this week, in fact, was how optimistic the, um, the CMB community is about their ability to measure um, you know, very, very sensitive measurements of the primordial tensor ratio based on observations that are carried out from the ground, which are both you know, going to happen over a shorter time scale and also with a um, you know, smaller expenditure of money relative to, um, to, 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 to the launch of a, a subsequent satellite to Planck. So I think this is a huge deal because if you can lower the tensor scalar ratio by a factor of 10 relative to where we are at the moment, then that has a huge discriminatory power in terms of your ability to, to, to rule out a large and significant chunk of the, um, of the inflationary model space. And so I think if you want to have a, you know, there's two versions of simple that, um, that, that coexist in the literature. And so from the point of view of people who are doing cosmology, simple often refers to simply the you know, algebraic complexity as a potential. And so the two models that you can really write down with a single term, you know, without you know, any you know, additional uh, folder off, is you need to have a model in which the inflationary phase itself produces the, the, the perturbations that you see. 
you need to have a model in which inflation comes to an end, and you need to have a model in which the bottom of the inflationary potential is arranged such that it doesn't, um, you know, that it, that it uh, produces a minimum where the potential has a value of zero. And so the two simplest examples that we can think where this happens is the case of the m squared phi squared potential and the lambda phi fourth potential. So one of those models has already been ruled out, um, famously ruled out by even the first um, release of the WMAP data. And the other one is actually looking quite ill if you go back to the previous, if we go back to the previous slide, the, the m squared phi squared is really starting to sit there at the sort of two sigma level relative to the, to the WMAP data. So both of these models are looking ill, and so there's senses of what, you know, what do we learn about that as theorists? And so what we might be learning is, in fact, that the universe is really Wilsonian in some sense, that it really cares about, you know, if you simply write down a naive potential where the, where the value of the scalar field becomes larger than the Planck mass, then you really better provide a detailed mechanism in which that can happen without turning on a whole bunch of extra interactions that are going to, um, to generically ruin that for you. Um, so there's many, many ways to define this simplicity, even ignoring effective field theory. And so just again, you know, this is an argument that's been going on for a long time. I just want to mention these, um, these two calculations. But it looks like if the, you know, if the, w, if the Planck um, you know, allowed region of that parameter plane so simply contracts around its central value, then we're going to be living fairly soon in a region where you've ruled out the simplest models of inflation. And you're going to be looking at models of inflation that may be more algebraically um, complex in terms of the ways in which you might want to define that. But on the other hand, may make more sense from the point of view of whether or not you have control over the, um, you know, the higher order operators that appear in an effective field theory description of, of your um, fundamental theory. So another way to look at this is, you know, you have really three different jobs. As I said previously, there's three different jobs that the inflationary potential has to do. And it has to provide the inflationary phase. And if you have a, a, a period of inflation that's um, driven by a very flat potential, then what that tells you is it tells you that dvd phi, the, 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 no, the epsilon parameter, which controls the tensor to scalar ratio and, and simple slow roll inflation. It's telling you that that is a very small number. And so if that's a very small number, it's telling you that the, infl the inflaton potential isn't going to be changing very much as you move by, by a small distance in phi. And that, that means that the, um, you know, that the scalar index is going to be dominated by the second order term, um, you know, the, 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 the eta term in terms of the standard slow roll inf and, and, um, expansion. So if you want inflation to come to an end, you have to put some sort of curvature in the potential. And you can either do that gently by putting in the, you know, a cubic, you know, the, the next higher order term, or you can arrange for the potential to have a sharp transition where you know, you're rolling you know, towards the top of the Grand Canyon, and then there's a very sharp transition that causes you to fall off the, um, the inflationary attractor, a so-called waterfall transition. And then on top of that, you have to add another, um, another, another piece to the potential to see that once you've made the potential steep, you can then make it shallow again so that um, inflation will um, come to an end around a, a stable minimum of the potential. So I think it's not unreasonable to say that there would be three parameters, you know, a model of inflation that has three, three free parameters in order to um, provide each of these features is probably not, you know, should not be regarded as excessively tuned because there are three separate things that the inflaton potential has to do. And it's just a happy coincidence that in the case of m squared phi squared or lambda phi fourth inflation that you can do all of those things um, with, with a single potential. So if, if I wanted to define um, simplicity in terms of low hour inflation, then I, I, would be, I would be happy to see a potential that had three adjustable parameters in it. Um, the next um, thing we can talk about is we can talk about the presence of features or the, rather the absence, apparent absence of features in the microwave background. And so this is something that I um, have been thinking about myself a fair bit this year because one of the things that we wanted to do um, in the warm-up to Planck, which I did with Herania Pires and uh, Raphael Klager, was to actually look at the um, predictions for a monodromy potential and to look at that in the WMAP9 data um, before the Planck data um, entered the public domain. And so we're looking at a, at a modulated potential here. I'm just realizing I may, in fact, be using a, um, a, a, a less ambitious version of this. So when, when um, in, in the final result, I think this... Um, this potential should actually be more, you know, should be visibly modulated, but still modulated at a level that's small relative to the overall amplitude of the CLs. And so this particular scenario is coming from, um, a, a, from a monodromy inflation model. And so there's no need for a, f a feature in the potential, and that's true both from the theoretical perspective. You know, there's no reason why you should violate the smoothness of, you know, the, the smooth and kind of gradual evolution of the inflationary universe. There's no, there's no compelling reason to do that. And there's also nothing in the data that makes that, um, that, makes that compulsory. But um, it's also true that features arise in many models. And I think it's arguably more common than the, to expect something to happen in explicit stringy constructions 
where you've taken an inflationary trajectory and you've somehow folded it into a more complex potential. Because as you, you know, as the, the, um, the inflaton field um, evolves its way through pot that potential, particularly with substantial values of R, um, of the tensor to scalar ratio, then I think, you know, it's, it's, you, you have to do some, um, you know, there has to be some complex construction that causes that to happen, which then opens the possibility that, that um, you know, that, these, that this com complexity will um, manifest itself in the power spectrum. And the other thing to be aware, of course, is if you had any data set in which you had no, you know, apparent two, two and a half sigma violations of smoothness when you've got thousands of numbers in your data set, you expect that there will always be, you know, two, you know, two and a bit sigma um, hints that there's something funny going on in your data set, and the absence of those would actually cause you more concern than, um, you know, than trying to continually sort of organizing ambulance chasing missions, missions to explain um, the presence of these um, apparent anomalies. So having said that, I want to focus on um, two examples. Um, the first is this monogamy potential, and so in a very um, restricted form, it can be written down in the shape. I noticed that I haven't included the term um, th that, that would cause this um, potential to be stable around its minimum. And this, um, this was discussed in some detail by, um, by Raphael in, in a talk in one of the parallel sessions. Um, the key thing is we analyzed it both in WMAP9 and Planck. And so the WMAP9 analysis was done um, uh, with Hiranya. And uh, then Raphael, uh, Raphael um, uh, took, in fact, the, uh, took the lead in, in analyzing the Planck data in some detail. And the question we had was, is we found, in fact, a fairly um, interesting signal in the, Planck in the WMAP9 data which we then had to ask whether or not we could recover that in the Planck data. The key thing about this model, rather than going into the, the nitty-gritty construction of this model, is that there are two clocks in this model. So there's a standard clock that controls the overall height of the inflationary um, uh, potential as it evolves, which is what eventually causes inflation to come to an end. But because this particular model, the inflaton potential, has been wrapped around a, um, a, a cycle in the um, compact space that's associated with string theory, the wrapping direction um, also introduces a second period, no, a second um, uh, time dependence in this model. And the wrapping, the time dependence of the wrapping in this scenario can be much, much um, more rapid than the time dependence of the overall inflationary model itself. So as well as having this you know, slow, gradual um, you know, decay of the potential as you move towards the origin, you also have this very rapid modulation, which is rep represented by uh, this cosine term here. And so this um, shows itself up in a modulated spectrum. And when we looked at the WMAP9 data, we found this very interesting modulated posterior for this F parameter, which um, controls the speed of the modulation. And you can see that there's a very strong and pronounced spike around a particular value of that parameter. Um, again, the amplitude of the, of the modulation term, again, because you have the strong spike, it also has a, um, you know, it has, it has a significant value that, you know, when this parameter B is zero, um, there's, no, there's no modulation. So one might uh, reasonably be excited about that. And when you look at the change in the likelihood from the WMAP9 data, the change in the log likelihood um, is on the order of um, 19. But um, this was not fully recovered in Planck. There's a lot more to do on this because, in principle, the WMAP9 data and the Planck data should coincide with each other when you look at a restricted um, sky map. Um, so it's not yet clear why it is that, that when you restrict um, the WMAP data, the, the, um, the Planck data, to look like WMAP, you don't see the same thing. Raphael, um, had, again, had some, some comments on exactly what the resolution might be of this um, in his talk. So you should uh, check with him for more details about that. But um, it is true that in the Planck data, you see an improved fit for similar parameters. It's just that the improvement in the, um, in the likelihood is, is, um, is less dramatic. So um, it's worth saying that the fitting here is hard work. Um, the difference, um, the results depend sensitively on the form of the modulation that you assume. Um, and so in particular, you might worry that if there really is a real signal in the sky and you're fitting some template to that signal and it's not quite the same as the real signal, what will happen is there'll be some region of L space, for instance, in which you're fitting the signal well and you'll see an improvement in the um, likelihood. But if, you're, if there's a slight mismatch between your template and the signal, there'll be another reason where, in another region, in fact, where you're out of phase and you'll actually wind up beating against the signal that you've got and the two, the two things will cancel out. So in a, in a scenario where, you ex where there really is some signal there, thank you, um, then you, you can, in fact, expect that there will be very, very sharp peaks in your likelihood, which makes this a much more challenging analysis than the sort of um, thing you might have done with um, you know, more smoothly varying um, parameters. Um, the second thing to say, which I think is important and a, a more generic lesson that can be learned from this, is that the delta, if you just use a delta chi-squared statistic, um, you know, there are three, three parameters in a modulation. It's phase, it's um, frequency, and it's amplitude. And so if you, you know, if you take the usual, you know, delta, you know, I'm going to fit to noise, so I expect an you know, improvement in delta chi-squared of you know, one per degree of freedom, 
Then it turns out that if you actually do uh, um, you know, simulations of this, so this is a result that Raphael obtained, um, it, it turns out that if you do simulations of this, you in fact see you know, a typical delta chi squared on the order of 10. And so the reason for this is, is, you're, is you're no longer in the, um, you know, in the regime where you can kind of you know, conveniently just expand the, the top of the likelihood surface in some you know, sort, of, sort of minimal Taylor series expansion. And so what that means is though, is that if you can, you can easily get a delta chi squared of 10 from this sort of scenario, which you might naively think was a fairly big improvement in your fit, but is in fact entirely what you would expect from fitting to noise. So whenever you're doing this kind of analysis of features um, in the primordial um, power spectrum, it's worth bearing in mind that, that, um, that what you see and what you analyze, um, you, know, you, have to, you have to be very, very careful with your statistics. Um, the next thing um, that people have been talking about a lot is the case of large angle anomalies. And so this is a nice example of the Planck sky map um, provided to us um, by the New York Times. And there's also a fine example here of, I'm, you can just see it in the newspaper actually, I think I've found the right one, the Stephen, you know, here we are at Cambridge and um, Stephen Hawking's initials are again um, clearly visible in the microwave sky. So what this, start, you know, what this really does is it, is it um, firstly there are no new news on large um, anisotropies in Planck because Planck um, is, you now these, these correspond to large scales and they were already measured um, to cosmic variance and doubling them. So polarization will make a difference. That's not yet available. There may also be interesting things um, you can do with cross correlations. Um, but in general, we're not going to learn anything about um, polarized, you know, very large anis anisotropies in the microwave background that we didn't already know before we started. The next thing to bear in mind is that there's a huge number of possible anomalies that you could imagine looking for in the CMB. So you might not just find, you know, no one yet has gone and found Ed Witten's initials in the CMB. So maybe that's telling you something about string theory. No one's found Isaac Newton's initials in the CMB. So maybe that's telling you something about gravity. No one's found Einstein's initials in the CMB. We've only found one. So we can imagine you know, at least you know, 26 squared combinations of initials that we could have gone looking for in the CMB. And we've found just one of them. So I think we have to be very careful of the fact that, we've, that we're performing an a posteriori analysis here. And we're focusing only on the possible um, anomalies that appear to be interesting. And so I talked to some statisticians um, at Auckland about this recently. They asked me to give a talk because I was using the phrase um, Bayesian um, in the title of my talk. And um, they said, oh, well, you should have worked all this out before you looked at the sky. In other words, you should have a hypothesis before you go and gather your data. And I said, you know, thanks for that advice. Um, <laughs> it's, come, it's come a little late, and we don't really have the luxury of doing that. And so the corollary of that is, is we have to be very, very careful when we perform this analysis because it's very easy for our monkey brains. Um, to pick out things that are, um, that are shiny. Um, in this context, um, I, I've been looking uh, with my um, postdoc at Auckland, uh, Gregor Aslani, and we've been looking at, um, at, at various ways in which you might uh, drill down on this. And in particular, as you know, there's a huge list of um, CMB anomalies. There's the axis of evil, there's a cold spot, there's a parity violation, which means that different CL, you know, odd CLs have more power, I think it is, than even CLs at low L. Um, there's a lack of power in the sky at low L. There's this hemispherical anomaly. If you look at the Planck paper, they're looking at p-values relative to random realizations of the sky. And so the question is, um, you know, there's nothing, all they're doing is taking a realization of the sky and asking whether you would see you know, this particular anomaly if you performed 100 or 1,000 realizations. And the question is, because there's no causal mechanism that's being provided in terms of this analysis, the question we wanted to ask would be, if one anomaly is real, which of the other anomalies would we also expect to see? You can't answer that question unless you have some mechanism that tells you how those anomalies were put there in the first place. And what we're trying to do is to say, well, let's imagine we have a mechanism for anomaly. Let's have a prior. And a particular example we looked at was to take a large, uh, you know, one K mode in the early universe, one particular mode, and to imagine that had been artificially amplified for some reason. Um, so this was a, you know, a large planar anomaly. Um, and it, it turns out you can, you know, when you project this planar anomaly onto the, um, onto the CMB, expand it in terms of YLMs, it turns out that it does, um, it will generate your parity anomaly for you depending on your alignment. So it can make some of the CLs large and some of the CLs small um, in the way that people have talked about. It can also, for some configurations, generate part of the multipole alignment. It won't necessarily generate all of it, but it can generate a piece of it. Um, and so you can, you can look at your best fit anomaly in terms of taking this, um, this particular anomaly, working out what your best fit is, and then you can ask which of the anomalies that, that it could have produced it actually produces. And in this particular case, we can do a good job of predicting the parity, parity anomaly um, or producing the parity anomaly and not so good job of producing the axis of evil, even though in principle we could have produced chunks of both of them. 
This obviously needs a lot more work, in particular, it depends now, of course, on the model that you're assuming for the early universe when you do this work, and it also assumes on the particular form of that anomaly that you've chosen. So there's another question, is what, am I, what is my basis of anomalies that I might inject into the early universe at large scales in order to perform this calculation? But at least if you have a particular model, then you can, perf you know, you can form some um, you know, um, assessment of the physical likelihood of any particular scenario that you're injecting because you now have some causal mechanism and it can also potentially, you know, the third thing it can do is it can produce potential anomalies that you haven't observed in the microwave background and the absence of those potential anomalies again is going to give you additional constraining power uh, re relative to simply fitting to the, um, to the sky maps itself. So the question is what next? I want to ask this question, no, and finally and grapple with the question of what's going to happen next in cosmology. And so what I have to put on this map is I put two hypothetical constraints on NS and R. I just, you know, just plot, you know, punch them in using the, um, the graphics tool in Keynote. And both of these things are where we might imagine ourselves being a few years from now. If we can shrink the, um, you know, the, the constraints on NS by a large amount or we can um, you know, either measure um, tentatively um, the, the uh, primordial um, tensor amplitude or alternatively that we can rule it out um, with some precision. And so the key thing to draw from this is that... Um, the inflationary predictions have a theoretical uncertainty. And it's worth reflecting on where those come from. All of the inflationary models that the Planck team shows, they show them as a line rather than a point in the NSNR plane. And this difference is related to reheating physics in the primordial dark age. So if we have gut scale inflation, we could conceivably have reheated the universe to a temperature of maybe 10 to the 15 or maybe even 10 to the 16 GeV. Or we may not reheat the universe until we had a temperature of a few hundred MeV because we, the thing we know we have to do is to produce Big Bang nuclear synthesis and the neutrino background. So the universe could have been matter dominated that time or something even more exotic might have happened. But if modes re-entered the horizon more slowly in a matter dominated universe than they do in a universe that's radiation dominated. And that means that you need to have fewer E-foldings of inflation in a model where you've had a, lo a long delayed period of, um, you know, where, matter do where the universe remains matter dominated for a long period after inflation. So this, um, this particular equation here is from a paper that I wrote with uh, Harania Pierce, where we're trying to work out the so-called matching equation in some detail. We had the number of neutrino species in and so forth as well. But the key thing to take away is if you imagine gut scale inflation and it remains matter dominated down to the TeV scale, you get from that the, the logarithm of the scale factor that you need differs by a, about a fact about 10 relative to what you would expect if you, um, if you uh, reheated efficiently. And that means you need 45 and not 55 E-folds of inflation. We know that DND log K in typical models of inflation is a few times 10 to the minus 4. And so that means that the theory error that we expect to see is on the order of 10 to the, is a few times 10 to the minus 3. That's exactly what we see. That's exactly the length of these lines. And so if we go back to, um, to the inflationary, um, the best fit inflationary results that we see, we see that currently we've met, you know, Planck has measured NS to within about a factor of 3 to a point where we're not only going to constrain an inflationary model itself, but we're also going to constrain the combination of the inflationary model and the post-inflationary expansion history of the universe. And so when that happens, um, we're going to be able to, um, you know, competing models of inflation disagree dramatically about what the primordial dark age should have done. Um, SUSY scenarios, for instance, are rife with moduli um, versus models that have you know, pr rapid um, thermalization. So we'll be able to tell the difference between those two things. And so even if nothing else happens, even if we add no new parameters to the, um, to, to, you know, to the standard inflation or uh, cosmological parameter set, I think um, it, we are going to be able to learn about the primordial dark age. And this is going to be key for model building because once you've built an inflationary model inside of the particular version of high energy physics, then you're also going to be able to say something about um, reheating in that scenario. It's also worth pointing out that dark matter and baryogenesis, um, dark matter ogenesis and baryogenesis have to take place in the post-inflationary universe. Um, I, won't, uh, I have a couple of slides on the um, parametric resonance and the production of gravitational waves um, in the early universe um, from oscillons. I'm just going to skip those. I'll put them online. Let's just go past these. Uh, this is um, actually just mentioned, this is work that um, I did with Ed Copeland and his uh, student uh, recently. So we've taken these oscillon scenarios that you can, again, uh, nonlinear dynamics can happen in the very early universe, produces a matter-dominated phase in a way that's um, completely invisible if you look at the um, Lagrangian itself, but that you, get, um, that you get coming out naturally just from the fact that you can have complicated dynamics in, your, um, in, in the, the underlying um, power spec, in the underlying um, uh, no, post-inflationary oscillations lead to the formation of these long-lived um, scalar field excitations and, and a corresponding uh, generation of gravitational waves in a way that was discussed in some detail again 
in the parallel session. Um, so to, sum, um, to, to move to my summary, before I get shown the, the, final, um, the, the final warning to the zero, so this is, I only had 35 minutes, you said I had 40. Um, so this, um, I think the summary is, is that the world is going to change, change for early universe cosmologists. Um, and the question I think we were all expecting, um, you know, that Planck would somehow lead to a first order, you know, a strong first order phase transition in our, in our understanding of cosmology. Um, the phase transition may be um, weakly first or, or maybe first order, but super cooled, and that there's some large surprise that's yet to come. Or it may change slowly, but I think eventually it's going to change substantially, um, even if we never um, wind up extending our lambda CDM. The second thing that we're learning is that apparently simple models of inflation have rich phenomenology. And working out the um, phenomenology is going to keep um, the community busy. Again, even if um, we don't, um, you know, the, the standard lambda CD and parameter set um, stays um, uh, fixed as a function of time. And finally, um, what we're learning is that simple models of inflation, particularly if you define um, simplicity in maybe a more sensitive way rather than simply um, sort of as a matter of historical accident, I think it's fair to say that simple models of inflation are in remarkably good shape at this point. And so that the sort of basic expectations that were formed around inflation um, in terms of it being a, something that correlates the universe on apparently super horizon scales, um, you know, the, you know, when the universe is very dense and very hot. Though that's a, um, that, that's a scenario that has been um, you know, strongly uh, confirmed by experiment and something that appears um, to now be a part of the standard cosmological furniture, which is not going to go away. So I think um, that's where I want to end. And um, hopefully the, the, I'm not going to see the minus five. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're kind of running a bit late, so let's just have one question. Oh, George, you've asked lots of questions. <laughs> Andre, just pick somebody. Huh? <laughs> I don't want to. I'm trying to look for some. Okay. Andrew, no, no, no. So, uh, Richard, the, if, you, if you go back to the beginning where you showed the residuals relative to the nodrimal model, right? Yes. Okay. I think this may actually be that, the wrong plot. But yeah. So, yeah. But it's, it's good enough. Um, so, the, the, uh, the thing is that, that what kills you with Planck is that third burst. Right. Okay? Because, you know, the, the, the first two, uh, the, the data of... of Highly cosmic variance, you know, the cosmic right. variance error is big. And so, you know, you, you, you can pick out something statistically from WMAP. But with, with Planck, that burst at 800 to 1,000, that produces large visible residuals. Right. Okay? And it's, and it's just excluded easily from the Planck data. So that's, you know, that's why, you know, the, the WMAP parameters don't fit with, with Planck. That's the primary right. reason. The second thing is that, that you know, I've spent a lot of time looking at the, these models and doing extensions which allow um, you know, your phase factor to vary with, with wave number because yeah. you know, just a slight mismatch yeah, yeah. can screw things Precisely up. the thing we're and, talking and about. And th th there is just nothing. Right? Um, no I, evidence for anything. That doesn't surprise me yeah. to hear it. I think the one, the one um, thing that I think still is to be worked out is why it is that we didn't recover. And I think, that, I mean, Raphael has some very good ideas as to why this is. So why it is that even in the range where you expect Planck and WMAP to agree with each other, you still don't see an exact recovery of the WMAP9 results. And so I think that... That will be in, in, in part, but you can't match experiments because the noise levels have dropped. No, and also because of the sky cuts. Okay, no, I'm, I, I'm not, I mean, my personal feeling is, is that, you know, it remains to be seen. I mean, my feeling is, is that, you know, the natural expectation is that, um, you know, is it, as I said, is that there's no, there's no reason to expect that, that features exist in a model as an example of a search for some. Um, the other thing I would say about this one in particular, again, if you, if you went to Raphael's talk, um, the region of parameter space in which you, I mean, the nice thing about this analysis is we have a very specific scenario that you know, rather than a, you know, a generalized modulation, which would lead to a look elsewhere effect. So you know, we've made one prediction and we've gone and looked at one model. Um, the particular region of parameter space where you find this very strong fit is in a region 
where the, the underlying physics may not be perfectly controlled. So you would actually potentially expect to see some change to this. I mean, both of those things, I think, need to be sorted out um, but before you can be completely, you know, it would be really nice to know where, where it is that this, that this additional noise, um, that this additional power comes from in WMAPA. And I don't think that question's yet been fully answered. I mean, there still remains you know, some, some um, mismatch between, I mean, this is the same points, I think, were made by um, David Spurgel and his, and his no. So I think you know, a year from now, I imagine we'll, we, we will understand this more cleanly. You'll make, well, maybe you understand it more cleanly but because you've seen more of the plank data than we have. So. <laughs> okay, let's yeah. thank Richard again. <laughs> and we're about to move on to the next talk. All right, do you want to borrow my plane? Or sure. you? Uh, actually, might not, depending on what, how old your computer is. And you'll want the, um, this as well. Well, it's a pleasure to introduce our final speaker, um, Ed Copeland from Nottingham on dark energy modeling and testing for it. Thank you, Anne. Um, thank you, everyone, for staying. <laughs> and uh, to the organizers also, thank you for helping me to get here. I arrived yesterday from Chicago, so it's six in the morning, so go easy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, the basic idea, um, just to tell you about the problems, okay? Issues with lambda, issues with dark energy, um, issues with modified gravity, although uh, Claudia's touched on those. Then testing for dark energy, and, and finally uh, an idea of hiding lambda, having a Harry Potter invisibility cloak, which shields me from lambda, let lambda be big and uh, let's see if we can get a universe that makes sense. Yesterday afternoon, Paul Shellard dropped a bombshell on me. He said he's looking forward to my conference overview. Well, given that I arrived yesterday afternoon and have missed every talk, <laughs> I did actually pick up two talks uh, from Chicago. I picked up George live because I was awake at three o'clock in the morning, and David Spurgel's talk I picked up after being out for a few glasses of wine with Rocky Kolb and his wife. And then I picked up the public event before my taxi arrived to take me to the airport. So these are my take-home messages from the various three talks. Um, if you want a proper conference summary, then you'd better look elsewhere. Um, don't use the word crap and Milky Way in the same sentence. One thing I noticed uh, as George did that was the number of viewings went from about, actually it was seven. I'm glad there were 3,000 eventually, Paul, because when I was watching it, there were seven people watching, and I was one of them. It went from seven to about 150. And so it made me wonder whether, you know, maybe there really is life out there. As uh, <laughs> Gaia will solve everything in the Milky Way. Uh, George firmly believes the analysis and results of the Planck team. He defended it uh, pretty robustly. Adam Rees thinks George is trying too hard. Um, a new number, I do, uh, so part of this is outreach, right? And I do a fair bit of outreach, and so I do a thing called number file videos. And so a new number has emerged, 217. And uh, not only is it, it clearly looks like it's a key Planck number, but uh, it's actually a, what's known as a bloom integer. And it's a, it's a rare number in that it's both the sum of two cubes and the difference of two cubes. So... <laughs> Uh, David Spurgel seems pretty convinced that Planck and WMAP are consistent than was perhaps uh, uh, initially stated. And uh, with the public talks, it's remarkable how different three types of talks to the public can be in their style. They were all good, but all quite different. Um, and finally, I think the, the detailed interaction and discussion following this, uh, throughout this conference has been ideal, and, it, and, it's, and it's as it should be. I mean, they've been... Some of these talks were quite technical, <laughs> and, uh, listening, trying to understand you know, what cleaning the maps meant, 
and uh, uh, it doesn't look like George likes cleaning very much, but uh, um, it's, this has been, it's been a very good meeting for that, to understand these technical issues. One of the weird things I find, I was thinking about the, um, the dark energy, it's one of the few areas that I'm aware of that a Nobel Prize has already gone for a discovery of something we don't understand. Um, you know, we know it, for the expansion of the universe, and then when you ask, well, what is causing the universe to, ex to accelerate, then we don't know. And that's what the essence of many of the talks and presentations have been about. You know, is it a cosmological constant? It, everything looks like it's suggesting it is. Very little evidence of anything deviating from a cosmological constant. But is it an evolving scale of field? Is it the modification of gravity? Is it some aspect of inhomogeneity that we're not yet really picking up on and uh, the, that we're seeing? Or is it something completely different and yet to be dreamt up? And let me just, I mean, one of, the bad, one of the bad things about being the last speaker is pretty much everything you've said has already been said. You're going to say has already been said, so I, I'll shoot through things. But I, I often hear people say, well, the cosmological constant is... Uh, from a Bayesian standpoint, it's the obvious thing to do, right? It's a number. It's perfectly consistent with Einstein's theory of relativity. You just add it in, and, and there's no issue. And so it's just this one parameter that goes into the, uh, uh, the um, Bayesian analysis. And yet, from a particle physics standpoint, it's a, it's a nightmare. And there's a whole load of baggage goes with it. And so to, to try and understand why it has the value it has. And so how you quite reconcile this one number, which for an astrophysicist you just put in, and there it is, and for the particle physicists trying to, trying to account for this one number, because you believe there's some particle physics input into it, it's anything but trivial to get that. And I think it's worth reminding ourselves, you know, the, the cosmological constant gravitates. And when you look at the observational value of the energy density that's driving the acceleration today, it's much, much less than what the theoretical aspect uh, values could be. And that's just as well, because if... <laughs> If it was much, much bigger, we wouldn't be here. The universe would have uh, remained in the situ and we, we wouldn't have formed any structures. So, but you can estimate what this vacuum energy should be and you have your th the theoretical vacuum comes from some initial bare vacuum, which we don't really know what that's going to be, plus a whole series of contributions, whether it be from zero point energies of the particles, <laughs> contributions from phase transitions in the early universe. So if I add up the zero point energies of the particles, like the leptons, the quarks, the, and uh, all the gauge fields, then you get some contribution which is uh, dependent upon the cutoff that you have in your theory. And of course, this is one of the reasons why people like supersymmetry, because for every bosonic contribution uh, uh, to the uh, number of degrees of freedom, you've got a fermionic counterpart, and this is what leads to the cancellation of these when supersymmetry holds. But supersymmetry doesn't hold anymore, so there's a, at least a TV scale when you're going to have some contribution from the uh, energy density of the particles. And then you've got contributions from phase transitions, whether it be the electroweak transition, maybe transitions occurring at the QCD scale, maybe transitions occurring at the um, grand unified scale, which will all contribute to this object in such a way that it makes that the observed value that we use, that we see, that's driving this uh, acceleration of the universe, is so much smaller than every other scale that we have, all of which could, in principle, have been driving the of our universe, and they're not. Why not? So we've seen, just to place things in context, here's the Friedman equation. Let me just remind you, this is the cosmological constant term, which is the thing that seems to be driving the acceleration of the universe. You've heard a lot throughout the conference about the equation of state. Well, what is the equation of state? It's, it's relating the pressure of the fluid that's dominating the energy density with the energy density itself. So, it's, so the pressure is related through this equation of state parameter W, and for a, a, a vacuum-dominated solution or a solution that dominated by a cosmological constant type term, W is minus 1. One thing that I'll, refer, I'll come back to if I have time is the way we parameterize W. Because if we're trying to test whether or not the cosmological constant is, is the right way forward, then we've got to allow for things that change with time because a cosmological constant is constant. That's the hints in the name. And um, so I've got to be able to parameterize an effective equation of state 
And, and, it, and the one that's generically used, it's used in the Planck analysis, is something like this. W is a constant value, so this is minus one today, plus something which is a, can evolve with uh, the expansion of the universe. But whether or not that's the best way, it, it, in particular for things like the Dark Energy Survey, surveys which are trying to look for evidence of evolution, then this is open for debate, I think, and I'll, I'll touch on this later. So this is just rewriting the Friedman equation to, to remind you that you can, you can, of course, have the Friedman equation where this, the, energy, the um, cosmological constant type term can be replaced by something which is evolving in time. And so you, that, that allows you then to start thinking about how does things like the, um, the Hubble diagram change with a, an evolving scalar field. So once again, this is a typical way that you parameterize the equation of state. Planck alone is, provides fairly weak constraints on the equation of state parameter because there are degeneracies between W and things like the um, expansion rate of the universe. And you tend to break those by introducing other probes. But once you introduce other probes, as George referred to in his talk, then actually the bounds on, on the equation of state change. Okay, and, and this is even assuming, so if I just assume the equation of state is constant, then you can see that depending on what other probes you introduce, you get different sets of values for your best fit values for W. So this is just telling you you have to be careful about your priors. As a theorist, looking at the data, you better understand or better be aware of what is being assumed. Okay, this, is even, this isn't even having any equation, e e evolution. This is just saying it's constant. And even then, you've got quite a, a wide range of values. One thing that I, I, I don't hear people talk about very much, but it seems to me, well, I'm, I'm quite interested in it, so I will talk about it, and I'm stood here, um, is that one of the, we will hopefully, with things like DES and then Euclid, actually be able to seriously probe the region where the acceleration changed, stopped. Right? We, we have not been in an accelerating universe for the whole of the evolution of the universe. We had to have gone through a matter-dominated period, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So as we go from the matter-dominated to the accelerating period, that's a change. That opens up, in principle, an opportunity to differentiate between models. And just see that change and probe it and understand that change, we, we will have a way of, hopefully, understanding the difference between models and basically ruling out sets of models and, in, and uh, not confirming, but uh, some models will survive and some models won't. So there have been many approaches to dark energy, of course. When, when you don't understand something, you try everything you can to try and understand its origin. I've tried to describe to you why we don't just simply sit back and say it's a cosmological constant and let's just, you know, get real and just get on with it, and why people have tried lots of things. So there's time-dependent solutions. They generally, you know, the particle cosmologist's favorite tool is a scalar field, and at last we can begin to talk about scalar fields and not feel slightly embarrassed. So there's a, so we've got time dependence ev evolving. We can modify gravity, as, as we heard so eloquently there by Claudia earlier today. We can talk about anthropic arguments, and uh, you know that's the string landscape for you. That that's we are where we are because without it we wouldn't be here. Um, perhaps it's general relativity, actually, but the universe is, is inhomogeneous, and we just haven't yet probed it right to pick up on those inhomogeneities. Then maybe we could do something quite radical. Perhaps we, the cosmological constant is there; it is big, but we're hiding it, and so I'll, that's, I'll touch on that a bit later on. And maybe it's the, the mechanism yet to be proposed. It's probably worth reminding ourselves that the evidence for the cosmological constant has been around for a while. Um, not everyone's taken it that seriously. Back in 1987, on anthropic arguments, Weinberg, in a very famous review of modern physics, very, a beautiful paper, argued why we should have a cosmological constant and that it shouldn't be zero. And then, of course, as we heard uh, Ofa mentioned, uh, observations of large-scale structure in the 1990s, late 1980s, 1990s, which was showing that standard cold dark matter scenarios were no longer fitting the data. And so I, I fully con concur with that change, sh sea change. I mean, when I started my PhD, everything was omega equals one standard cold dark matter. Then things be it began to be clear things were struggling to fit the data. 
And actually, George, who was PI on the APM data, that in 1990 wrote a, a, a Nature article where he actually suggested the cosmology is dominated by a cosmological constant with omega less than 0.8. But the, the subject didn't really take off. It was 19, you know, the reality is the type 1a supernova data is what caused, caused the sea change in, t in terms of how people reacted to the presence of the cosmological constant. So if a cosmological constant is fundamental in some sense, you might say, well, where is it? The string theory should be providing me with some mechanism to provide it. And back, I mean, the majority of string theory models are basically supergravity, in terms of cosmology, are basically supergravity models in higher dimensions. We don't really know how to do the full string theory calculation, so we work with the low energy supergravity representations. Gary Gibbons back in, in the 1980s demonstrated the no-go theorem which suggested you couldn't have the sitter-like solutions in these models. Or you, which, so, it, it, we, in other words, it forbid cosmic acceleration. As long as the models, the internal space-time was time-dependent and a compact manifold without boundary. So if you have a no-go theorem, how do you get around the no-go theorem? Well, you violate one of the things that has gone into the no-go theorem, okay? And then, then you can go. So... So the, the typical way that you violate the no-go theorem is that you allow your extra dimensions to vary in time. Okay, these are the radions. These are the size of the extra dimensions, the compact dimensions. So these, by allowing that, you break this uh, uh, no-go theorem, and then you can begin to look for some sort of accelerating scenarios. You want to stabilize them at late times, usually, because these scalar fields coming from the extra dimensions are typically coupled to the important gauge couplings that we, that we have today. Newton's constant can vary if you're not careful, and we know we've got tight constraints on those kind of things. So we need to be able to stabilize them eventually, but we can, we can evolve them. And so this has led to a number of approaches. The brain world setup, which is the one that has led to the um, idea of the landscape, has, that's required an uplifting terms uh, in order to achieve the de Sitter solution. The usual... Um, your generic solution to supergravity models is, is an ADS solution. Okay, the, the minus everything. You have to uplift it to get to a, a, a de Sitter solution. So here's your typical ADS minimum. You uplift it with a term and, and you can develop a, um, a de Sitter solution, which has to be fine tuned to get the kind of values you want. But once you accept that, then you, you open up the possibility of having many types of solutions. Because in string theory, where you compactify from 10 down to four dimensions, then the internal dimensions are stabilized by the fluxes. And there are many ways of orienting, orientating the fluxes in order to stabilize the dimensions. And these are what give you your plethora of um, vacua. And so the, the orders of magnitude are 10 to the many hundreds that people talk about. And then you've got a typical separation that would be of order 10 to the minus 500 of the Planck scale. Well, this is, this is like incredibly fine-tuned then, uh, not fine-tuned. There's a fine, um, finely grained system. Given that your, the value of the, of the uh, cosmological constant is like 10 to the minus 118 Planck scales, and the, the, the uh, fine grading that's going on here is so much finer, it's, it's fairly straightforward to get to something like that. And so you can, you can argue that... This means that there's a, there's a mechanism around through some sort of tunneling which will allow me to get to the kind of values that we have today. It seems to me that the problem with this, or, or if, if, if you're happy with the anthropic elements, it's not a problem, it's a solution. You've solved the cosmological constant. And I think a, there's a group of people think there isn't now anymore an issue with the cosmological constant. It's just an anthropic argument that we'll, we, we have a vacuum. There's a, there, is, there are solutions out there, although they haven't been found. <laughs> The, the, uh, the argument is there for their existence. But the, if you're like me and the, you don't particularly want to go that way yet, then there, you know, there isn't one true vacuum. There are many. And it, it makes it impossible, really, for us to determine which one is the one that corresponds to us. People are trying to put measures on. I mean, our previous speaker, Rich, is one of those. Is trying to put measures on this landscape. What's the likelihood? similar to the type that we have. But it's, not, it's, an, it's an open question still as to how successful this will be. 
So let me just refer to a couple of uh, other ideas that have emerged. I mean, uh, you heard uh, Cliff uh, talk about his, uh, his own model, what the, but the, which I'll just describe very generally. It, what's nice about that is that you have a higher dimensional model, right, in which the four-dimensional cosmological constant, which is the one we're experiencing, at a classical level is cancelled by the presence of curvature in the higher dimensions, okay? The two extra dimensions provide a curvature which cancels out the contribution of the Four, of the four-dimensional cosmological constant, giving you classically zero cosmological constant. And then you generate an effective cosmological constant through loop corrections. That's the basic idea that's going on there, and that's a very nice idea. Okay, now the technical details then have to be worked out how well it really works. But the idea of managing to cancel out at the classical level to then generate something at the quantum level, I think is a very nice approach. Another idea, which uh, one of the problems we'll discuss in a, sh in a, in a moment, w w when you have dynamical dark energy driven by a scalar field, is this scalar field has to be very light. Claudia touched on this. Quintessence models have the same degree of fine tuning as the cosmological constant problem. Light scalar fields mean fifth force experiments are going to test them and normally rule them out. So you, you need some sort of screening mechanism. And in the world of particle physics, one way that you can do that naturally is by having something which has got some symmetry associated with it, which pr forbids that mass scale from coupling in such a way that it can be ruled out by fifth forces. An axion will do that for you, a pseudo scalar which has got derivative couplings there. And there's some very nice ideas um, of, of using the axion as a not just a, as a dark matter candidate, but also as a, as a candidate for dark energy. So um, um, Kim and uh, Peter Nillis have such an idea where um, in the world of string theory, they've got the possibility of having two axions present, one arising out of the extra dimensions, one which will solve the CP problem, the strong CP problem, and link into dark matter, and then the other which will provide me naturally with a scale of about 10 to the minus 33 electron volts, which is the right scale in order to... Um, provide the uh, dark energy, the acceleration that we need in dark energy today. So this is known as the quintessential axion, and I think is one of these which is certainly worth uh, pursuing because it has inherently, because it's due to scale of this particle or this field, has its mass protected. So the idea of, of having a dynamical evolution of the dark energy is goes back for has got a, a long uh, history associated with it now. And the, the main feature that I think is present that, that, that is attractive about it is that you generally have what, they enter into what are known as tracker regimes, this region four here. So the red line here is the dotted line is your background uh, energy density and radiation and matter. That's just dropping off as the universe expands. The N is log of the scale factor. And the energy density is just dropping off. And then you've got the contribution from some scalar field, which is your quintessence field. And the, the generic idea is it will enter a tracker regime. And then for some reason, something in the potential, it will come to dominate at late. Okay? So you, and entering a tracker regime is quite nice because it means you're less susceptible to the initial conditions. Because you can start the, the field at, any, at another value of, of, the, of its energy density, and it will move along and join onto that tracker. So that's one of the nice things about the idea of slowly rolling fields. It makes the initial conditions less important. But the downside that you have is that you have to fine tune. So here's just a, an example here's a, that will give me the type of um, um, behavior I require. You can either think about it in terms of the energy density of the field evolving as a function of time or of the effective equation of state of the field. So what a track of field will do, it'll mimic the background energy density. It'll just be subdominant, mimic the background de energy density, and then come to dominate at late times. So here it means for a while it's got an equation of state of about a third. That's radiation. It moves into a regime where it's got an equation of state of, do of zero. That's matter. And then at some epoch it comes to dominate with an equation of state of minus one. And the, the price you pay in all of these, I don't know of a quintessence model that doesn't have this, is that you need to fine tune because you have to es establish the energy density that it has it, when it comes to dominate. I'll just below it. And that it dominates within the recent.
usually makes it very small, 10 to the minus 33 electron volts. And so that then means that there are fifth force constraints come in. And so a lot of effort has gone into trying to develop scalar field models which avoid those fifth force by, as Claudia talked about, having screening mechanisms. So here are three types that are, that are out there in the literature. The chameleon does it by coupling the scalar field to matter in such a way that the effective mass of the field depends upon the local matter density. So in, a, in the solar system, the effective mass is very high. That means the field doesn't move very much, so it doesn't produce any long-range interactions. But on cosmological scales, where the effective density is much lower, the field can run free. And then you can experience, it can then act as a quintessence field and drive the acceleration. The K-essence idea is where, is, are the ones that Claudia was, was concentrating on, where you have non-canonical kinetic terms present in the theory. You have extra gradient terms, and that can provide a mechanism by which the strong couplings that arrive from these, having these derivative couplings can become important in the, in the presence of uh, massive sources. And that can be in such a way that the, it again protects you in local regions and uh, don't play a major role in, um, outside of that. And then you have another type, which is a symmetron field, where instead of having coupling, the mass of the field being important, it's the VEV of the field that's important. You have phantom fields, which have an equation of state being less than minus one, and I think it's amusing that at the moment the Planck data suggests that. Um, you can have interacting dark energy. Why should dark energy and dark matter be independent of one another? They're not. Maybe they're coupled together. And doing that, you actually then have, often have a mechanism in which to naturally force the dark energy to start dominating. So if, you, for example, you decide to couple the dark energy with the neutrinos, and then ask when does the neutrino mass turn on, then you can do it in such a way that the neutrino mass turns on just as the dark energy becomes important. And so you have a scale, a time, which actually you can justify in terms of why, why the dark energy is dominating when it is. So you've gotten a way of addressing the coincidence problem. The key thing when you're trying to differentiate between these various approaches isn't just going to be looking at the background dynamics of the field, it's the perturbations, which what Ofa was referring to. And, and because that's where you're going to get extra information out. And so the coupling of your quintessence field or your chameleon or whatever you have to matter and the associated fluctuations that you get in, um, when you solve Einstein's equations are really important in helping you differentiate between models. And of course, when you're starting to talk about structure formation, you're generally beginning to have to go into nonlinear regimes. And so you need to begin to think about how do you couple them in with large scale simulations. And this, believe it or not, is only just sort of really taking off. The idea of it's been around about 2005 or so, Gadget, um, Springle wrote a code uh, called Gadget. But the idea of introducing modified gravity into there now to also think about large-scale structure with modified gravity is, is, has begun over the last two or three years, and it's a very exciting field. What effects can you get? Well, because these fields interact with standard model particles, then that's in, that there's inevitably going to be some interaction, even if it's indirect. So light-scalar fields that react with these standard model particles will mediate a fifth force. But as I said, we don't see any long-range fifth forces, so we have to have various screening mechanisms present. The dark energy changes the way, for example, that photons propagate through magnetic fields. So a polarized photon can fluctuate into a dark energy particle. So you'll get deviations in, in the number of photons being emitted and being, ob being observed if, as they go through regions of strong magnetic fields. And so you can begin to ask, what, how would I test that? And there's some nice paper work done here by actually our chairperson who's look for evidence of dark energy through changes of, in the scattering of luminosities from high energy sources and looking for evidence of correlations between the polarization and frequency of, of starlight being emitted. Not surprisingly, as, as these models are being tested and being pursued, then people now begin to ask, well, do they make sense? Are they they're generally written as classical field theories? What happens if I start seriously thinking about the quantum effects? And so, for example, one of the uh, a recent paper by uh, 
Claire Burridge and her collaborators have questioned whether or not the classical treatment that we've used in developing the idea of the chameleon field actually is appropriate. And the reason is that the chameleon field couples to the trace of the energy momentum tensor. And in a radiation dominated era, that vanishes. And that can lead quantum mechanically to rapidly, rapid particle production. Rapid particle production often means then you're going to have to start taking into account back reaction effects. But you haven't done that at the classical level. And so it's not saying that the chameleon's not working, but it's saying that the framework in which you're doing these calculations may not be the right framework to do. You need to do it as a true quantum system in order to see whether the chameleon actually really is working as you expect it to. We've recently been discussing the idea of, of probing for some of these uh, chameleons, simitrons within the laboratory. And uh, so I just thought I'd, I'd mention this. Um, so with uh, Ed Hines at Imperial, we're thinking of setting up a system where we basically have a Bose-Einstein condensate and you separate the condensate. And then you have one of the condensates go to a very ma close to a very massive source and the other one's far away. A chameleon field will, will change, right? Because you've seen Chameleon fields react to the density. So if a chameleon field is propagating through that, it will have a different value close to this massive source than it has close to the condensate, which is uh, in vacua. And then you bring them back and we'll get some interference effects. And so the idea is you try and probe these models through this kind of issue. Well, I'm not go going to go into modifying gravity. I mean, you've heard uh, so eloquently earlier today about that, but there are many approaches that have been taken to try and um, modify gravity. We heard about DGP, we heard about scalar t how scalar tensor theory is, Galilean models, um, massive gravity, and then uh, issue. But on all occasions, you know, we have issues over stability that you have to think about, present theoretical uncertainties, presence of ghosts, instabilities uh, arising due to the presence, for example, in massive gravity. That was what Claire was asking Claudia about at the end of her talk. But it's a very exciting field, and of course, that's why people are working in it, because the potential rewards are big. So let me, let me ask the following. What should we do to help determine the nature of dark energy, given we've got these uh, various models? I think we need to properly define the theoretically predicted observables to determine optimum ways of, to parameterize, for example, the equation of state, so that observers have a bet the best possible chance of seeing any evidence of evolution in that equation of state. We need to start including the ideas of dynamical dark energy, interacting dark matter dark energy scenarios into the numerical simulations. And this is now being, this is beginning to happen, okay. And um, maybe we need to start thinking about how do you include gastrophysics and star formation in there. But of course, there's so many uncertainties in, in that region. It's what Martin Rees would call mud wrestling. And so it's not so clear adding in yet another unknown like the dark energy or some aspects of modified gravity. You, you're going to glean very much from that because it's already so complicated. On the theoretical side, we want to develop models that go between our, just our illustrative models. I've tried to give you an idea with extended quint quintessential axion models, um, landscape predictions. The sitter vacuum is very, basically pretty hard to get in string theory. We need to probe more now this very interesting, exciting area of massive gravity, really test the consistency of it, the questions about the, the, you know, the constraints on, on the graviton mass itself from um, uh, loop corrections. Will we be able to ever reconstruct the underlying potential? Will we be able to de determine whether or not W is equal to minus one? Can we, should we be looking for alternatives? given that the severe constraints that all of these models are under, um, for example, such as shielding the cosmological constant. So it's a very exciting time with the things like the Dark Energy Survey now taking data and future missions like Euclid, um, LSST, as well as proposed giant telescopes, let's not forget them, which are gonna be coming on stream, like the GMT, ELT, SKA, all traveling in new directions. Here's for you is just a little uh, teaser. What do you think is the connection between the remarkable woman, Amy Johnson, and the SKA? I'll leave you, for those of you who have got really bored with what I'm saying, why don't you just have a think about that? Um, so just to reiterate this thing about parameterizing the equation of state, for example, you know, what we, we've seen that the way it's been done is, is pretty much this way. It's, it's, 
W of A is some constant plus a function of if it was 1 minus A times W1. We could instead go for some sort of principal components approach where you, pick every, you can pick out everything, but you need lots and lots of components. Or we could try and do something which allows for the problem with just having that, that linear dependence on A is that if you do have something which is a tracker solution, that's rubbish at finding it. Okay, because it, it, it's just the constant plus a straight line. And a tracker, you want to be able to see something evolving. And so maybe you need to think of something which has got a little bit more flexibility in it. Or perhaps you should be using something like the, uh, the energy density and the dark energy itself as a way of probing. And this, I think, is quite, this is a recent thing that I've been involved in. Um, and this, I think, is quite, quite interesting because actually it turns out that when you parameterize in terms of the energy density of the dark energy itself, its maximum sensitivity is around Z of or order a half, which is quite nice if you're trying to look at the turnover in the, um, in the, from acceleration to deceleration. So let me just finish in the last two minutes by uh, motivating the Fab Four. Okay. So we've seen, we know that in general en relativity, the vacuum energy gravitates, and the theoretical estimates suggest that it gravitates too much. The idea here is to hide it, is to say, okay, let the vacuum energy be there. I'm not going to try and cancel it out, you know, by some mechanism to get an effective value of, 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 of you know, 10 to the minus 3. Um, I'm going to let it be there, and I'm going to hide you from it, hide us from it. So, by, and I'm going to do it by shielding it with the evol evolving scalar field. Um, Ofa referred to this, and there he, that this is the Horn-Desky action. It's, it's pretty complicated, but all that we need to see is that it couples the scalar field to various combinations of the curvature. Okay? And, and what you can do is you can ask the question, is there a self-tuning solution? A, a solution which, independent of, a, of the presence of a cosmological constant, will be the same at late times. And there is. And you can, you can determine the conditions under which it will, will occur. And this is the condition that that long action reduces down to one that has just three, four, sorry, potential type terms. And so you can see why. Well, Tony Padilla is a collaborator on here, and he insisted on the, on the, the Beatles. And now you can just start asking questions about the evolution of this system. You can see the, the field couples to curvature terms and scalar fields. And you can find solutions which, let me just try and show them to you. The late time solutions are basically flat space. Independent of what's happening to the cosmological constant, this system evolves down to this late time scenario. Of course, this isn't where we want to be. The, the hope will be that as the system evolves there, it, it finds um, a cosmology that we're, that, that we're used to. And so, Here's an example of it just going through a phase transition. The scale factor, as the system evolves from a, 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 from a so it's a symmetry break in phase transition, and the scale factor just ev keeps on evolving through it. And then the richest scalar, there's a, for those of you close by, you can just see a little bump here, and then it goes flat. And you can find solutions that act like stiff fluids, radiation, curvature. And the, the hope, here's an example of one that acts like radiation. Remember, there is no radiation. It's just the combination of these scalar fields. And that it then evolves down. This is the acceleration parameter. It evolves down to flat space at late times. This is a matter-like one. And, and our hope, and although we haven't done it, I'm working with, uh, we're working with Ruth Gregory on this. Our hope is to try and find a cosmology that makes sense that then will be an alternative that will give us something that people can go and probe. We haven't got there, and we may not be able to get there. It might not work. But I think it's a, it's a neat idea that you have a system that isn't worried about the cosmological constant at late times. It will evolve to some self-tuning solution. And it could be that we have a way, then, of, of finding a cosmology with it during it. Hondesky, by the way, went to Amsterdam to a conference. He went to, he went to a Van Gogh exhibition and got hooked by it and left physics. And he's now an artist working in Santa Fe. So that's it. Um, so depending on your faith in, this, in the idea of the string landscape, you, you, you could argue there isn't a cosmological constant problem. It, it, it's an anthropic argument, and, and it's solved. If you don't want that, then you need to understand why the value of the cosmological constant is what it is. And quintessence-type approaches 
require light scalar fields, so we've got to deal with fifth forces, which means we've got to have proper screening mechanisms. And there are a number of ways of doing that. Alternatively, you could try considering modified gravity, which also will bring in with it various screening mechanisms, and such as massive gravity. And this, but as I said, this brings in with it its own constraints. I haven't had time. An area that people are now beginning to work in is to, to develop the equivalent of the PPN formalism that's used to constrain the solar system to think about working on um, generic modifications of Einstein's theory applied to solar system constraints, applying that to the cosmological constraints. And um, I haven't had time to discuss that today. That's the PPF formalism, and there's a lot of work going into that at the moment. And then finally, I mentioned the Fab Four, which is basically a way of living with a large but changing cosmological constant. And that, even if that in its own right won't work, I think the idea of being able to do that is a very interesting idea. And so there's something in there. It's the seed of a, of a potentially interesting feature. So thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, I think there was a typo on one of your uh, transparencies. Oh, right. It wasn't Burgess, Davis and Shaw, it's Burridge, Burridge. Davis and Shaw. So, that was a typo. <laughs> I think Burridge might still be here. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, we've got time for a couple of short questions. Uh, just a minor point on your discussion of... Um, predictions of an acceleration pre-1998 mm. on Larry's behalf. I think you know, it's worth saying that there were a whole bunch of theoretical papers, as I'm sure you know, by people like Lawrence Krauss, and Michael Turner, and um, Sean Carroll, and they were mainly motivated by the time span of the expansion. You know, mm. But I, I think Krauss in particular talks about a jerk between a deacceleration and an acceleration, so it's, it's quite prescient, you know. And the only reason I, I, I mention it is it feeds into over his talk, because I think when we talk about a paradigm shift, especially to the younger researchers, most of us, we like the word paradigm, but the shift thing is completely wrong in the Kuhnian point of view, because it's always gradual. It's, it's, gradual, not, it's yeah. not a step function or anything mm. like it, which is quite important. Uh, any more questions? Everyone tired? Okay, well, let's thank Ed again. I want to thank all the speakers who've helped make this conference a really great conference. And also, a conference would, wouldn't be the same without its participants. So thank you very much, all of you, for coming. For those of you who've contributed to our uh, plenary talks, our parallel talks, or who've just contributed to the discussion and the atmosphere. Thank you very much.